handle these products from the sea to the table. But then there's an issue here of challenges of eliminating the middleman. Many, many uh, 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 fishermen, agriculture farmers, including seaweed farmers, have been complaining about the price exploitation, about how they are failing to uh, sort of uh, produce or to uh, gain any, any net profit because of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, uh, powerful uh, sort of uh, cloud of middlemen uh, uh, engaging those small-scale entrepreneurial um, systems. But then there are issues that are very much general, issues of processing, uh, transformation, post-harvest losses, the whole context of coal storage facilities and other uh, infrastructure um, areas. Um, another subchain, the sea cucumber, the Matango Bahari. So we all know that China is the largest global market in Matango Bahari, and we in Tanzania and even in Zanzibar have been able to capitalize that. On that, 84% of the global sea cucumber trade is, uh, um, ends up in uh, China. By 2019, Madagascar, Seychelles, Zanzibar, Mozambique, and Mauritania supplied 230 metric tons of sea cucumber to Hong Kong alone, because Hong Kong is the principal port of entry in terms of the sea cucumber. In 2019, Zanzibar exported 30 metric tons of sea cucumber, and then COVID-19 hit. When COVID-19 hit in, 20, uh, in 2020, the production, the export, collapsed to nearly 5.53 metric tons per year, down from 30 metric tons in 2019. But with the post-COVID-19 recovery interventions, by 2023, we are still going back up, we are still recovering steadily, and we have, uh, by uh, June of this year, been able to, uh, to uh, produce about 15 to 20 metric tons, by 2026, we uh, anticipate or we project that production would increase to above 45 metric tons, and that is, um, uh, if not surpassing, but leveling the Madagascar baseline export level of 45 metric tons. Now, these would depend on how the post-COVID-19 recovery project really um, 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 works in terms of, of uh, supplying, supporting, and elevating the sea cucumber farmers in Zanzibar. We all know that the sea cucumber is a very uh, uh, valuable product. It ranges from US dollars 100, uh, even before it has been exported, a dried one per kilo, to US dollars 850 when it reaches tables in China, in, in uh, Hong Kong, and other areas. But then we have an issue of export certification, and that is why we are working together with the Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries so that together we can certify the, these products under the conditions that are, that are, that are ascribed by the, uh, by the uh, importing nations. And then uh, also we need to uh, focus on how do we, do we protect the sea cucumber farmers from, the, from risks such as theft and the security of the agriculture um, pens. And then in Zanzibar, we are continuing to rebuild and build more hatchery facilities we have one massive uh, um, um, hatchery at, at Bububu, Mtoni, and uh, with collaboration with the non-governmental actors like Mombao, Mombao have already uh, built another community hatchery in Pemba in an area called um, Pudini. On the, uh, the issue of mud crab, uh, we call it Kiswahili Katope. So the global mud crab uh, trade is really uh, increasing. Uh, by uh, last year, uh, mud crab trade across the world ranged uh, between 3.7 to 5 million metric tons, but when it, uh, by, and, and, and it will be increasing to about 4 to 5 million by 2026. Each mud crab, kila ka tope, a kilo moja ya ka tope, ambaye yubatika hali nzuri, can fetch up to 20,000 Tanzanian shillings per kilo locally, but in Asia, it can sell from $25 to $35, $40. And that's another big potential of the low-hanging fruit of the blue economy subchain that is known as Kartope. In 2020, as in sea cucumber, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, COVID uh, impact uh, almost uh, caused the collapse of the, uh, of the uh, export. By 2026, uh, uh, sorry, by 2022, we have recovered 
to about 176 metric tons. By mid-2023, January, June, we are already at 136 metric tons compared to last year, which had a total of 176 metric tons. So at the end of the post-COVID-19 recovery intervention, by 2026, production will increase, or we are projecting the production to increase to above 400 metric uh, tons. And then there's an issue of seaweed, another very important key critical subchain of our blue economy value chains uh, in Zanzibar. The global seaweed potential is never ending. I mean, right now it stands at around a potential value, a potential value of 13.3 billion US dollars. Industrial seaweed market value, however, we are told, stands at around 5.9 billion uh, dollars. Compare the potential value that is already estimated under blue economy valuation systems with the real practical uh, value at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, market. But the global seed production has increased from 600,000 metric tons in the year 2000 to 32.4 million metric tons in the year 2020. In the past 20 years, the world has, become, has been busy in terms of developing, producing, expanding seaweed um, um, economy and seaweed um, um, industry, and that also includes the islands of uh, Zanzibar, as well as the coastal uh, regions of uh, mainland Tanzania. So production in Zanzibar in 2022 was at 12,594. The target by the end of the post-COVID-19 recovery uh, program is to, as the minister had already uh, pointed out, is to go uh, between 25 and 30,000 metric tons by 2025, 2026. The export stock last year was at 14,000 metric tons. But of course, we have been suffering from low prices, but we are thankful that right now in Zanzibar, we, we have, uh, already completed the construction of the massive uh, seaweed processing uh, plant in Pemba, HM Manangwe, which will be able to process 30,000 metric tons of seaweed. Um, um, and and, and, and the, the idea is to pr extract the main ingredient, the seaweeds are gold, and that is the carrageenan, for that carrageenan either to be exported or to be processed to other products or to be uh, engaged into other pharmaceutical industrial um, um, areas. But also uh, climate change, the sea level rise, the sea surface temperatures, more and more farmers are being compelled to go and cultivate on the deeper sides of the subtidal basins of the Zanzibar archipelago. And that poses risks. It poses risks in terms of the uh, uh, um, safety, in terms of the market viability, but also in terms of the entire uh, sort of a um, um, economic impacts of climate change of that particular um, stock. But then the issue of processing capacity, we are also now working with uh, Korea on the Quaker program. We have already, uh, or we are about to sign the uh, Integrated Multicultural Value Chain for Women Empowerment in uh, Zanzibar, and that factory in Pemba will be able to develop clusters of products that, that could be made from various uh, seaweed um, um, needs. And so um, you, you have noticed that I've been talking about post-COVID-19 recovery, post-COVID-19 recovery. This is the project or the program that was made possible thanks to the efforts of the President of Tanzania, Mweshimiwa, Dr. Samia Suluhu Hassan, uh, with the IMF uh, uh, post-COVID-19 recovery um, loan some of it has come to Zanzibar, and we are thankful uh, to, pre to uh, President Dr. Hussein Alwini for his vision in terms of investing money in blue economy value chains. And so uh, this is the, the, the structure, the, the ecosystem of what we have been doing in the past uh, almost two years of post-COVID recovery programs in blue economy value chains. So 22.5 billion uh, shillings have been invested in uh, producing, as the minister had pointed out, 1,077 fiber boats 
with original Yamaha engines, GPS um, um, tools, fish finders, um, um, fishing gear, um, um, uh, nets, and, 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 and many more for uh, small-scale fishers as well as seaweed farmers. So we have produced five meter fiber boats with Yamaha engine for seaweed farmers who will be able to go and cultivate on the deeper side of the intertidal basins, not beyond the reef, within the reef, but also um, the, uh, uh, the uh, 577 uh, fiber boats of uh, seven meter length to eight meter length to, to the small scale uh, fishermen. And the idea here is to make sure that we move beyond four nautical miles and we Yeah, it's supposed to, uh, to uh, wind up, yeah. And so uh, 1.5 billion uh, shillings have been uh, invested in helping uh, uh, empowering women's uh, working tools in terms of the seaweed uh, um, processes. 16.9 billion shillings goes to anchovy drying and processing facilities that are currently being built in uh, Zanzibar. 400 million shillings on 100, 100 sea cucumber and other, and, uh, other mariculture pans that the minister has already pointed out and also the, the, the construction of the, of the fish ponds. But again, we need to invest in knowledge, awareness, innovation, and almost 700 million shillings have been invested in making sure that the small-scale fishermen and other seaweed entrepreneurs are pretty much engaged in terms of capacity building awareness and, uh, and all those things. Um, these are the, uh, some of the key uh, programs that we are um, implementing along with development partners, some of whom are here uh, in this room. For example, uh, we expect now under the support of the Ministry of Livestock and Fisheries, the government of Tanzania, that the BBT program will come to scale up that particular program that we have uh, I mean, uh, engaged uh, so far. The World Bank is uh, supporting the uh, success of the Sea of Fish project under the, the uh, Task Farm Tanzania Fisheries and, and uh, Our Culture Management Program. AFAD is already on the ground uh, supporting the uh, the uh, communities in terms of, of the fisheries and, uh, and uh, our country support. AFDB with the skills, um, capacity building for the blue economy. FAO, um, WFP, UNDP, EU, and many more who have already been working alongside the government in terms of the uh, uh, bringing about the blue transformation. So this is the brief highlight of what we have been doing in terms of the low hanging fruits of blue economy in Zanzibar, starting with these sub-chains that make up the fisheries and our culture value chain. Let me stop here. Asante Nisan. Another round of applause to Dr. Abud Flayman Jumbe. If you followed this discussion, you might have noted there's uh, a number of insights on policy interventions, but also he has alluded to a number of investment opportunities there. To really uh, uncover the potential, the full potential of um, the blue economy, uh, we will require significant investments and enabling policies to address uh, the specific challenges that are captured. Let me add a few other specific opportunities. The infrastructure will need to be further developed. The growth will need to be sustainable and investment will require in specific activities with high potential such as seaweed farming. In just uh, a few um, seconds, 90% of Zanzibar's trade goes through the port of Malindi. The port, however, requires significant investment to manage the increasing volumes as it is not up to capacity today. Due to the cr overcrowding, it may take up to five or six days for vessels to unload their cargo, leading to loss of productivity, higher fees as they wait. Um, addressing this will require both modernization of the port's infrastructure, technology, and extension of container depots. These insights point you to some excellent opportunity that exists in the islands of Zanzibar and the mainland of Tanzania. Let's have a look. This is Zanzibar, an archipelago off the coast of Tanzania, known for its natural beauty and rich cultural heritage and consists of two large islands, Unguja and Pemba. Tourism is one of the major sources of income 
in Zanzibar accounted for nearly 29.2% of the country's GDP and 82% of its foreign exchange earnings in 2019. Potential areas for investment in the tourism sector include hotels and accommodation, culture and heritage, marine tourism, sports tourism, arts and entertainment tourism, meetings, incentives, conferences and exhibitions tourism, and halal tourism. The island also offers a range of investment opportunities across various sectors, making it an attractive destination for investors. Zanzibar is strategically located along the East African coast, making it an ideal hub for trade between Africa and Asia. The island is accessible via an international airport, seaport, and the infrastructure on the island has improved significantly in recent years with ongoing upgrades to roads, bridges, and ports. The social economic development of Zanzibar depends significantly on marine-based resource utilization, which involves sustainable use of coasts, oceans, and marine resources. As a result, in 2020, Zanzibar adopted the Blue Economy concept. Hence, the bulk of Zanzibar's economic performance is dependent on efficient utilization of its ocean-based resources. Fishing takes place along the coastline. The fisheries sector supports directly and indirectly over one-third of the Zanzibar population. In the heart of this Indian Ocean archipelago, a strong tourist inflow primarily drives Zanzibar's real estate sector and more recently, changes in residence permits allow foreign investors to acquire long-term leases in Zanzibar. Several residential projects have been developed in Zanzibar. In addition, due to its unique location and geographical connectivity through the international airport and a new upcoming ferry terminal, the residential and commercial projects will generate a high appreciation of capital. Zanzibar, an archipelago, with alluvial soil, seasonal rainfall, and strategic geographical location for trade, and supports a vibrant agricultural sector with multiple crop production. While most food crops produced are consumed locally, cash crops such as cloves and clove stems are grown predominantly for export. Potential areas for investment in the agriculture sector include fruits and vegetables, spice farming, livestock, and forestry. Manufacturing is at the core of structural change and generates employment, thereby improving social welfare. This is in line with Danzibar's objective of enabling sustained economic growth while creating job opportunities. Potential areas for investment in the manufacturing sector include textiles, apparel, cosmetics and related accessories, building and construction materials, assembling and packaging. The ICT sector in Zanzibar is primarily focused on building the necessary infrastructure and delivering e-governance services to different government departments. ICT sector is a cross-cutting catalyst that offers digital services and product innovation in all the key economic sectors in Zanzibar. Telecom and broadcasting are one of the potential areas of investment in the ICT sector. Zanzibar has huge potential for oil and gas. The sector is in exploration stage and is an area of focus alongside the blue economy. The government is in the process of developing oil and gas regulations that will ensure a balanced coexistence of the oil and gas sector with fisheries, tourism and other offshore development activities. The revolutionary government of Zanzibar is now welcoming all prospective investors who wish to invest in Zanzibar. It is our expectation that the said investment opportunities, among others, will garner your attention. I assure you that Zanzibar is politically, socially and economically stable, making it an ideal investment destination. My government is committed to continuing our role to provide a conducive and friendly environment for you to invest in Zanzibar now. Karibu Nisa. From its vibrant culture and history to its stunning natural beauty, Zanzibar is a place that captivates and inspires. Come, invest, 
and explore the magic of these islands. Welcome to Zanzibar. Welcome to Zanzibar. What else, what kind of assurance do you need not from the head of state himself? Mushmua Abdallah Ulega is a Minister of Livestock and Fisheries of the United Republic of Tanzania. Tanzania has the longest coastline than any geography in East Africa. It has uh, the largest water bodies in the, in the mainland. To unpack that for us, and in case our brothers in Zanzibar have left out something, please, Mushmua Ulega, come on stage and highlight some of the other opportunities on the mainland. Karibu. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it has been said it all. Nothing has been left behind, for sure. <laughs> but one thing I can uh, aid from the very good presentation done by Honorable Minister Suleiman Makame and added up from the expert Dr. Jumbe is our PS from Zanzibar and the good video that has everyone right here see it and it, it explains everything so for, from my side, I just want to tell you, in a blue economy and the fisheries, it is a hanging fruit. So the opportunity is huge, and uh, we ask for a uh, more cooperation, investment, and our doors are open. Look, we have the gap. We are producing about 500,000 tons of fish per year. We, Tanzania. And again, the demand seems to be 700,000. So, and there is no uh, a way in the capture fisheries that we can do wonders to fill this gap. So, now our direction mainland is to look after aquaculture and that was why the, our government decided to put more effort in cage farming ponds and all this so to fill the gap for these 200 tons 200,000 tons of uh, of fish Nikisema kwa Kiswahili, and I see uh, the gadgets are here, so maybe, yes. Fursa ni kubwa mno, na ni pana sana. Kwa hivyo, bado tunayo nafasi ya kufanya zaidi. Gap tulilonalo, linajionesha was kutoka tani la kitano mpaka tani la kisaba na kwa msingi huo pamoja na jitihada ambazo tunazitazama kwenye eneo la uvuvi wa asili lakini ninadhani kwa uelekeo wetu ni kusukuma zaidi upande wa ufugaji wa samaki ndio maana tumeanza upande wa kufuga samaki kwa njia ya vizimba hususan kule ziwa Victoria na tutaendelea 
mwaka huu pia na zaidi lakini niseme tu jitihada hii yote ambayo tunaifanya as a government is to attract the private sector to come and make it better kwa sababu tunaamini kuwa private sector yawezekana haikuwa ikiamini kwenye hii biashara sasa si serikali tumechukua jukumu la kufungua milango na kuonesha njia ninatumai hapa wako watu wa benki hususan benki yetu ya kilimo the tdb is, is here rayo ah upo eh enjoy huko mbele hopefully you be asked a lot of questions people need to see more investment uh, access to finance to do all these things so katika serikali sisi tumeonesha njia kwamba ufugaji wa samaki unalipa hapo nyuma hata kukopesha boats mzunguko ulikuwa ni mkubwa sana na ndio maana nimemsikia waziri kutoka Zanzibar amesema serikali ikaamua kutoa boats kwa soft loans na hata siye pia vile vile huku tunakwenda kufanya hivyo na boat is a range ya kuanzia 5 meters up to 14 meters ni kubwa 14 meter na upatikanaji wake sisi tuliamua kuwapelekea wavuvi wenyewe kwa seme wangependa aina gani ya boat hatukununua tu na kuanza kuzigawa so na hii cage fishing pia vile vile ni kitu kipya na kwa msingi huo watu wengi wamevutika sasa na wameona kuwa ni kitu cha uhakika cha kufanya ukifanya investment kwenye eneo hili unafanikiwa lakini mwisho niseme juu ya EEZ uvuvi wa bahari kuu uvuvi wa bahari kuu tulionao ni mkubwa sana bado kiasi ambacho tunatoa fursa if you compare to the opportunity that we have the gap is so big so we invite everyone from the different angles of the global to come and invest with us watu wengine wana wasiwasi na usalama wanasema maybe they are pirates na vitu vya namna hiyo i just want to assure you leo tuta sign deal na wa china makampuni makubwa ya china to allow them to come and do fishing with us kwenye EZ lakini vile vile tunakwenda ku exchange deal na kampuni kubwa from Europe linakwenda kwa jina la Albacora from Spain sasa narudia kuwa hakikishieni the global community siku moja nilikutana na balozi wa Japan alikuwa na wasiwasi anasema the problem is pirates sio hapa kwetu sisi hakuna jambo la pirates nataka ni wakisheni ni safe if you go and visit our office in Zanzibar Fumba the deep sea fishing authority unaweza kuona tuna kitu tunaita VMS ile VMS 
inaonesha kila meli iliyopo within our territory lakini tuna uwezo wa kuona mpaka meli iliyo nje ya mpaka wetu Kenya Mozambique Comoro Seychelles unaweza ukazivuta ukazileta hata zilizoko Somalia unaweza ukaziona hata zilizoko South Africa na kutokana na ufanisi wa mfumo tulio nao ili tusaidia hata hapa nyuma tulifanya zoezi moja zuri sana kupitia mamlaka yetu ya uvuvi wa bahari kuu na government organs zingine zote za jamhuri na za Zanzibar tulikamata meli ambayo ilibeba uh, madawa ya kulevya na ilitoka mbali sana ikafanywa traceability mpaka tumei track mpaka tumeikamata kwa hivyo jambo la pirates halipo huko sisi tunataka meli nyingi zaidi zije na sasa hivi tumeyafufua mashirika yetu ya uvuvi liko la mainland linaitwa Tafiko Tanzania Fisheries na lipo la Zanzibar linaitwa Zafiko and why this is to promote PPP kwa sababu mtu mwingine anaweza kafikiri anataka kuja kupata incentives za kufanya kwa pamoja na wenyeji hapa na ziko incentives za kufanya pamoja ambazo wataalamu baadaye wanaweza kuzieleza na zingine tunaendelea kuzipush kwa hivyo haya makampuni kazi yake ni kufanya biashara tafiko zafiko wana fursa kubwa kabisa if someone wanataka kuja kufanya biashara hiyo tunawakaribisha na ukiingia mikataba na hawa utaenjoy not only in the deep sea lakini unaweza ukafanya biashara kwenye territorial waters and even kwenye inland waters kwa sababu wao watakuwa ni custodian wako wewe ulitoka nje kufanya biashara ndani ya nchi yetu kwa urahisi kabisa kwa hivyo tunawakaribisheni sana na nadhani kama utapata nafasi yuko zipa ataeleza hapa kwa kirefu sana juu ya hizo fursa na labda TIC kama sijui na yeye amekuwa uh, informed na yupo kwenye ratiba ataeleza hizo fursa kwa kirefu zaidi mwisho kabisa tunaomba tu tutoe shukrani tena kwa mara nyingine watu wengi mmejitokeza kuja kuona hizi fursa na tunawakaribisheni kuekeza na sisi asanteni sana another round of applause so, so ladies and gentlemen we've we've had we've uh, listened we've tried to showcase albeit in a very brief uh, space but i think it does provide um, what is there definitely the development of the blue economy in tanzania does present great potential and but of course there are challenges to address we've had um, some policy challenges but also uh, infrastructural challenges. It's the time for the audience to really uh, speak to um, uh, the, 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 um, um, the peoples on the um, um, uh, panel, and I will be opening up. We'll go, we have about 30 minutes of, um, of conversation where you would like to unpack some of these um, um, uh, challenges. So. Um, I would like to, to call the Minister of Agriculture as well from Zanzibar to join the panel because I think there will be um, uh, the, the peers. I'm sorry, to, there will be uh, some questions from the uh, from the floor. 
Um, TIC, uh, Zipa, uh, I think there will be some questions as well to be, to be responded just in case, so you can join the panel. Uh, I will start on a very uh, high-level question, and I would like to, to ask whether it's Mwishmua Waziri or Blue Economy, our peers, um, uh, the contribution of uh, fisheries, uh, the fisheries and the aquatic economy, to the GDP of Zanzibar is around 4.8%. The aspiration is to get Zanzibar and, of course, uh, the United Republic to a middle-income country. Other countries are moving to high, higher income. But I think for us to achieve the middle-income country, our economic sectors must grow at least between 8 and 10%. What is the strategy to make this sector grow at at least a single digit. I'm, I know you've highlighted some of the um, elements of your strategy, but please uh, spend some time to uncover for us um, the key strategic undertakings that you will put in place to enable this sector to, to grow between 8 and 10% from where it is now, where it is just under 5%. Um, uh, Dr. Abu Jumbe. Thank you very much. So, um, and in the meantime, the, the questions, short, brief question that needs clarity. I'll pick up um, hands from the uh, from the floor as uh, as we continue with the panel discussion in the next thirty or so minutes. Karibu. Thank you. The approach is on two um, strings of attack. Attack number one: community empowerment. Attack number two private sector investments. You cannot empower the communities without private sector investments. You cannot boast of private sector investments if you have not adequately empowered the communities. So on one hand, the government is investing a lot of money in making sure that the communities are becoming part and parcel of the blue economy uh, train that we are now on. On the other hand, the government is investing, injecting, dedicating towards opening up towards the private sector so that the, the private sector supports the value chains that are very much part and parcel of the uh, national uh, economic drive. So we had started in 2020 at 4.5% um, um, of the GDP. In the middle of 2023, uh, according to the recent European Union value chain study, that is not the study that the government has done, because, because people will say, oh, you did the study. No, the, the EU value chain for development analysis study has already indicated that the strategy is working. The midterm, we are at 6.3% uh, of the GDP. And so the Zanzibar development plan target of 10% by 2025, 2026, we are on track. Thank you very much. Mshmua um, Waziri, illegal fishing is a, is a big challenge, and this will probably dent some of these very rosy uh, insights that uh, the PS has provided to us. What's the plan to address illegal fishing on, uh, on the Zanzibar Island? Thank you very much. Uh, I do agree with you that illegal fishing is one of the big challenges in, uh, in not in Tanzania, but uh, globally. But uh, Tanzania, we, uh, we have, as the Minister of Livestock and Fisheries said, we have our, our institution authority that is uh, Deep Sea Fishing Authorities, mm -hmm which is responsible for combating this IUU fishing. We have a legal instrument. We have uh, a day-to-day -day, uh, It's on. It's on. OK, it's been. We have, an, uh, we have operations. We are doing an operation by using uh, aircrafts, uh, boats, and uh, we involve our, our military uh, sectors, uh, military instruments to make sure that we are combating IUU fishing. 
we are attending so many meetings and forums to make sure that we are cooperating with other regional and national uh, uh, institutions and authorities to make sure that we are uh, combating IUU fishing. Though we have strategies and the uh, instrument to make sure that, and uh, what, as from what the minister said, we are safe for the time being. There are some few uh, vessels are engaging on IUU fishing now, but in a large, to that extent, to large extent, IUU fishing now is uh, being controlled in our, our our country by using our our authority, deep sea fishing authorities and other institutions within Tanzania and the region. We are cooperating with uh, uh, our neighbors, Mauritius, Seychelles, Mozambique. We are cooperating each other to make sure that we are uh, sharing some information and experience on how to combat uh, IU fishing. And we are doing well. Thank okay, you. fantastic. Let me open up the floor, uh, questions from the floor, from whoever you want to shoot the question for any clarity that you would seek from uh, uh, them. Um, just make sure your question is very brief and uh, to the point so that uh, we can have a lot more questions from, from the audience. I already see three hands. The first hand is on front from the lady sitting in, in the first row here. And then uh, there will be a, a microphone on this side here. Let's just pack the microphone. And then there's, uh, there's another hand on the second row. Why don't we start with the lady uh, in front? A very good morning to everyone who's attending today. Um, what I would like to say is that there is a success story that I would like to share today. And that success story comes from an implementation on different strategies that the government of Zanzibar has created and opportunities that have been created for young domestic investors. I have invested in the two economy. I have an exporting company that exports seaweed as a raw material, but I have been facilitated by the Ministry of the Blue Economy and uh, ZIPA and the Ministry of Investment and uh, the Ministry of Investment. So I've been facilitated with space to actually add value to the seaweed industry, whereby I now create cosmetics and um, food supplements, where, whereby we'll be exporting them as well. So my only issue is that how do we solve the problem of exportation? Because I do have an exporting company, and it's very, very expensive to export. If you use uh, air freight, it costs from $5.7 a kilo to $7 a kilo of any item you're, you're shipping. That is extremely expensive because the way we sell seaweed, we, we, uh, we sell it for $1 a kilo. So you add $7, that's $8. If you're, if you're shipping off one ton, that's like $10,000 and whereby you only get like $1,000 as profit. The 70% of that goes into airlines. So how can we leverage our own airlines, our own postal offices to help us ship more? Because the market is there, believe me. But how can we export it in a, in a more affordable way? That's all. Thank you very much. Uh, if you can introduce yourself, I think uh, we just didn't get uh, what you're doing, who you are, because I think it seems you're doing a great job in this area. My name is Kulthum Issa Mabad. My company is Mabad International Exporters, and the brand that we've created in Zanzibar is called Melanin Gold Organics, whereby we have cosmetics, uh, organic herbal cosmetics that heal skin and hair, and um, multivitamins. So, Karibuni Sana Zanzibar. Zanzibar is really doing the work. Asante. Okay, well, thank you. So, we, we had the question. The issue really is the challenges around export. How do we really uh, ensure that it's, it's, it's affordable, it's cheaper, and being able to really take these uh, um, goods to the market? Uh, Professor Yunus, uh, uh, I think you've got your next death. Thank you. Uh, 
I have a small question. Why don't you just introduce yourself, what you do, and uh, okay. I'm, you know. I'm Yunus Mgaya, chairman of the board of directors of Tanzania Fisheries Corporation. But otherwise, I'm a marine biologist. Dr. Abud, uh, in his presentation, he did allude to fishermen, or even the seaweed farmers, not getting a fair share of their product. And he said one of the strategies is to remove the middleman. Now, if you look at the entire value chain, you have all kinds of people before the product reaches the final consumer. And one might refer to every point along the value chain mm -hmm. as occupied by middlemen. Now, if you remove the middlemen, who will be there to facilitate the logistics? Or you, or you wanted to say you want to regulate the sector so that every point along the, ch along the value chain uh, gets a fair share of the, of the business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Abud, you need to unpack that for us for more clarity. Uh, let's just move um, on this side, on the second row, and then we will pass the microphone um, on, on the third row on the gentleman in uh, white, after the lady. Habari za subuhi. Zuri. Kwa majina naituwa Beatrice Tofili Mbaga, mwenye kiti wa taofa taifa. Na suwali, au nataka kusema kwamba, wavuvi... Suwali lako na muuliza nani? Na muuliza waziri wavuvi bara. Katoka pacha wake atajia. Pacha wake atajisaidia. Naibu yuko pale. Na mwakilishu wake pia yupo. Fantastic. Yeah. Na, na kirefu cha taofa ni Tanzania Women Fish Workers Association. Kwa hiyo wavuvi na, na, wak, na wakuzaji wa viumbe maji, wadogo, tunakabiliwa na shida ya mitaji. Na tunapokuenda kwenye mabenki, tunambiwa sisi siyo rasmi. Bati nzuri leo nimeona kuna taasisi ziko hapa na mabenki wameambiwa wa soge mbele. Lakini pia kuliwe Zanzibar, kuna asilimia rubaina moja ya wanawake wamewezeshwa. Hilo tunalifrahia. Jeserekali yetu sasa, ina utaratibu gani kutueka vizuri na hizi taasisi za babenki ili tuweze kusaidika na kuongeza mitaji yetu. Uh, nafikiri mtu wa benki hata tusaidia pia kujibu kusabu na kika kuna kitu kinafanyika hapo. Kwa Asante sana. Itarisha. Mina ito Bakari Kadabi, ni mwenye kitu wa kamati ya ushauri juu vuvu endelevu zio Victoria kwanza ni kiri kwamba niseme kwamba Tanzania ni sehemu ya Afrika. E, juu ya kwenda kwenye uchumi wa blue kusu masuala ya ufugaji wa samaki ilo aliyapokiki. Ndio mfumo wa kidunia. Lakini asilimia sabina tano ya wavuvi ni wavuvi wadogo wadogo ni wavuvi wa asili na ndio wanaoendesha ulaji wa samaki. Hilo pia tunapaswa tuliangalie. Wakati tunaingia kwenye ufugaji wa samaki, tusipoangalia tutaluka hatua na kuacha asilimia sabina tano hawa ndio wanayetulisha kwa sasa. Na ndio wanaendesha uchumi wa maziwa makuu kwa upande wa ziwa Victoria na maziwa makuu. Lakini uvuvi ni biashara. Hivi ninavyozungumza kilo moja ya sangala leo kwa mvuvi ni shilingi 1800 mpaka 1500 kuna 1900 mpaka 1900 kuna 1000 1011 mpaka kuendelea huyo aina ya samaki ya sangala nafikiri ndio anatuingizia mapato karibu ni asilimia ngapi Tanzania anauzwa mpaka nje Ulaya lakini tunapokaa kuzungumza bila kuangalia aina ya samaki huyo ambaye ndio ametoa ajira eh, tunakwenda kutengeneza ajira mpya ya ufugaji wa samaki ambayo hatujui kama itafanikiwa au la lakini ajira ambayo inaenda kwa sasa tunakaa bila kuijadili na kuisema vizuri kulinda ajira za viwanda kujilinda ajira za wavuvi kama nchi tulikuwa tunakosea ninaomba sasa kwangu mimi na naomba serikali tunahitaji kulinda mazalia ya samaki tunahitaji samaki waongezeke Sangala biashara ya kila siku iendelee wavuvi wetu si tunawajua 
wamezoea wakiweka mitego yao am, akiweka ndoano akivua samaki wa tano, sita akienda kuuza anapata shilingi elfu kwa sababu samaki kama ni kumi, kumi anapata laki moja kama ana samaki kumi, anapata laki moja ameweka hela mfukoni kwenda kumuingiza kwenye ufugaji wa samaki aanze kumlisha asubirie kuja kupata pesa tuna changamoto hiyo tunaiona nadhani tumekuelewa ya kwamba tuna balance vipi ufugaji na kuendelea na ufugaji uvuvi wa asili na tunataka serikali ituambie ni namna gani itaendeleza sekta ya uvuvi ikiendeleza wa, wanao wanao fuge samaki bila kuacha wavuvi wa asili na kwa hivyo tutapata majibu hapa ya kisera ndio ndio kutoka kwa mawaziri wanaoasante tupate swali moja la mwisho kutoka upande huu alafu tuwaruhusu wajibu alafu tutakwenda kwenye raundi ya pili na kuna mkono hapa katikati Asante habari uh, za asubuhi salamu alaikum na itwa Fazalisa kutoka ubalozi wa Island Tanzania uh, sisi tuna support na fili ilionyeshwa pale uh, shirika la IUCN kufanya kutekeleza mradi wa bahari mali ambao ni sustainable economy kwa Pemba pamoja na na, na Tanga na tuliona katika swala kubwa sana hapo ni kujumuisha kati ya uhifadhi pamoja na uh, livelihood sasa tumesikia uh, mipango na, na, na progress nyingi ambazo zimeelezwa ningependa pia kujua swala moja uh, namna gani tuna future proof the investment that uh, we are doing now uh, especially on the fisheries sector mipango na progress imefanyika kwa kiasi kikubwa namna gani uhifadhi uh, wa coastal and marine ecosystem inafanyika na kwa ushirikiano wa pande zote uh, mbili kwa pande wa bara pamoja na na, na visuani katika swala hili la la uvuvi pamoja na uchumi wa bluu kiujumla asante na basi tutoe fursa kwa eh, mawaziri na wataalamu waweze kujibu maswali nitamhitaji mtu wa benki ya kilimo useme kitu usiposema mimi nitasema kwa sababu najua mnachokifanya sasa mimi nikisema itabidi unilipe kwa sababu nitakuwa nimefanya kazi yako tuendelee Mheshimiwa Waziri jinsi nilivyojipanga kujibu maswali kwa kadri ambavyo walikuwa wameuliza kuna maswali ya kisera lakini kuna maswali ya uwekezaji eh, na kuna lile eneo la, la export challenges tuone namna ambavyo tunaweza kusaidia karibu tafadhali nikushukuru nikushukuru lakini pia na mimi mpongeze sana dada Kulthum kwa kujitoa kama kijana kuja kuwekeza kwenye swala zima la usarifu wa mali amefanya kazi nzuri na amekuwa balozi nzuri sana e, kwenye suala za ramani kwa wazalishaji na amekuwa ni exporter wetu kwa miaka kadhaa kabla mwaka moja kuundwa hii wizara ya uchumi wa blue kwa ufupi tulimkuta katika industry nikubaliane naye kwenye changamoto hii ya usafiri nadhani mkurugenzi wa zipa ambaye ndio anavutia zaidi wawekezaji anaweza kutueleza e, tunao mchakato unaendelea wa kuanzisha airline Zanzibar e, ambayo ikikamilika basi inaweza kupunguza kwa kesi kubwa challenge kwa sababu itakuwa ina mkono wa serikali lakini ujenzi wa bandari ya Mangapwani nayo na ikikamilika itapunguza kwa kiasi kikubwa challenge ya usafiri na usafirishaji kwa sababu lakini pia na uzalishaji ambao tutakuwa tunazalisha na, na zile movement za meli zitaongezeka na itapunguza zile kosti meli ambayo inaleta containers 400 Zanzibar ikiondoka bila container utalazimika kulipa a huge amount kwa hiyo tuna strategies nyingi za kiwekezaji kwenye transport and transportation moja ikiwa moja ya priorities za uchumi wa blue kwa hiyo tutaendelea kufanya kazi kwa pamoja nawe na kutokea challenges serikali ipo basi tutaendelea kushirikiana. Kuna swala la mengine nitawache wenzangu watajibu. Kuna swala la middlemen ambalo kaulizwa katibu mkuu. In fact hatuendi kuondoa middlemen, tunakwenda kuondoa unofficial brokers ambao wamekuwa wakiwafyonza wale wa uzalishaji wadogo wadogo anakuja mtu anasema mimi ni mnunuzi wa dagaa kutoka Kongo 
ukimwangalia in fact sio mnunuzi yeye anakwenda kuchukua ile property ile product ya yule mtu yeye ndio anakwenda kuuza alafu mzalishaji anabaki anasubiri pengine mpaka inakuja msimu mwingine hajalipo kwa sababu ya uwepo wa wale watu kwa hiyo sio wale middleman ambao wanaweza kufacilitate ni wale unofficial brokers ambao kazi yao ni parasites sio middleman ni parasites kazi yao ni kunyonya wale wadogo wadogo hao ndio ambao tumesema hao lazima wakae wakae pembeni other middleman ambao watakuwa ni official kwa ajili ya kufacilitate biashara we are ready to go with them lakini jingine ilikuwa ni swala la bwana Bakari ambalo ameuliza wavuvi wadogo wadogo vis-a-vis aquaculture nadhani kwa trend tulionayo kama mwenyewe ambavyo ametangulia kusema hatuwezi kuepuka aquaculture na hatuwezi kuepuka aquaculture kwa sababu tukiangalia bwana Bakari tokea umezaliwa ume experience wavuvi ziwani wakivua we don't know how stock we have now katika ziwa Victoria na kama tunayo hiyo stock maana lazima tuitumie vizuri kuibalance lazima tuwe na subsidy ya ufugaji ili tuweze kubalance ile zao lililomo ziwani ili siku moja tukafika pahala tukawa na jangwa Victoria maana tukiamua kuchukua resource yote bila kuweka subsidy basi kuna siku ambayo tutakuwa tunadhalamika sasa wa yule mvuvi ambaye anakwenda baharini na kurudi na sato na sangara kumi atarudi na sangara wawili and we have experience on that kwa sababu walio tumia bahari katika maeneo kama hayo vibaya bila kuwa na, na balance sasa hivi tunaona kwamba wanaanza kuzunguka around the world kutafuta maeneo ya ya uvuvi kwa tuendelee kuinvest kwenye aquaculture tuendelee kusupport wavuvi wadogo wadogo ku balance ili tuendelee kuwa na sustainable use ya Ziwa Victoria na sustainable use of the ocean kwa manufa sisi tumekuta lakini e, watakao kuja baadaye pia waweze kutumia ile rasilimali iliyopo lakini be na mind kwamba duniani sasa hivi ukisikia nchi ina export kwa wingi largely ni kwenye aquaculture wana export kubwa kwa sababu ni kitu ambacho unakiona uhitaji kwenda kukitafuta kwa hiyo naweza kujibu kwa kifupi na niwaachie wataalamu wa dadavua zaidi. Na kushukuru moderator. Asante sana mheshimiwa waziri. Sustainable use of our natural resources is a key message. Uh, nafikiri kuna swali la muhimu sana la financing ambalo ningetamani sana nisikie. Alafu uh, kama mheshimiwa katibu mkuu nataka kusema kidogo kuhusu mawili matatu ya kisera basi tutakupa nafasi. Tafadhali. Asante sana. Asante sana. Um, labda ni ungane na wenzangu sababu swala la financing ni universal universal na sisi kwa Zanzibar tumeanza lakini tuna imani kubwa sana kwamba tumeanza kwa sababu tuna support kubwa ya guarantee na security nayo ya Jamhuri ya Muungano wa Tanzania na tumeanza kwa sababu baada ya kuingia kwa serikali ya awamu ya nane jambo la kwanza lilikuwa ni kukaa na hizi financial facilities na mabanki na kuanza kuzungumza hili jinamizi ambalo linaitwa collateral linaitwa collateral kwamba huna collateral upate mkopo huna collateral upate mkopo siri ya mafanikio ya programu yetu ya ahueni ya uviko 19 siri yake ni kwamba sisi kama serikali tumechukua dhamana tumechukua dhamana na kusema kwamba huu mkopo ni mkopo wa bei nafuu ni mkopo ambao una zero riba kwa Zanzibar serikali ya mapinduzi ya Zanzibar imechukua dhamana na hiyo ni mojawapo kati ya malengo ya serikali ya kuwawezesha wananchi kuwawezesha wanajamii kujenga ujasheria mali ambao hawatakuwa negatively exploited kwa hivyo tuna imani sana kwa sababu tumekaa tumekaa na mabanki mbalimbali na mabanki yapo tayari na mabanki yapo na sisi ukianzia TADB ukienda CADB Amana NMB PBZ NBC mabanki yote hayo tumekaa nayo yapo tayari katika utekelezaji wa program nzima mkakati na na na, na, na sera nzima ya uchumi wa ambayo inashajiisha 
mkopo wa bei nafuu mkopo usiokuwa na riba mkopo ambao utaweza kumwezesha yule mwananchi kuendelea mbele katika swala la simu la small and medium enterprise na swala zima la, la 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 small entrepreneurial uh, credit support kwa hivyo hiyo fursa ipo ni swala la kupata ufahamu ni swala la kupata uelewa ni swala la kupata elimu na ni swala la kuangalia benki zipi zinatoa huduma gani kwa ajili gani lakini fursa hizi mheshimiwa moderator zipo kabisa na ishu ya ya na nyonge mkono uh, uh, mheshimiwa asiri sisi we are not going to regulate the middleman we have established zanzibar fisheries company we have established zanzibar state seaweed company not to regulate but to compete we as the government have entered the market for so many years that market was a wild west where everybody anybody could do whatever they could to exploit our people we have entered the market with the capital with the strategy with the approach and that is the fear that we we know that the those who are not really uh, positively bent on engaging the trade are uh, uh, basically communicating but for us we are basically competing we have entered the market we are ready to engage anyone na kwa sababu pia tunatengeneza viwanda viwanda vya mwani viwanda vya kusarifu madaga viwanda vya kusarifu samaki na hii pia it is another automatic catalysis ya kuondokana na ile negative exploitation ya the middleman asante sana okay in one minute or two uh, Tanzania Agricultural Development Bank is an agricultural bank in a broader context of uh, agriculture, livestock, fisheries, and crop. So talk to us about what you're doing on, the, on that area so that uh, people in the room are aware of the programs. In a minute or two, we're running out of time. Asante sana, Modelita. Ninaizungumza nani kwa majina naitwa Mkani, David Waziri, ni Kaimu Kurugenzi, Dala ya Mipango, Sela na Utafiti kutoka benki ya maendeleo ya kilimo Tanzania. Benki ya maendeleo ya, Tanz ya kilimo Tanzania tunaendelea kutoa mikopo kwenye sekta ya kilimo lakini pia tunagusa wavuvi na wafugaji. Na kwa sababu nimepewa muda mfupi nitazungumzia specific kwenye wavuvi. Please. Kupitia serikali ya Jamhuri ya Muungano wa Tanzania ya awamu ya sita tumeweza kwa kushirikiana na Wizara ya Mifugo na Kilimo wale mifugo na uvuvi tunatekeleza mradi unaofahamika kama Blue Economy for Growth. Kwenye mradi huo wa Blue Economy for Growth tunatoa mikopo isiyo kuwa na riba kwa wavuvi wanaohitaji zana kwa ajili ya uvuvi kama fiber boats. Ukija kwetu utapata mkopo huo pasipo kuwa na riba yoyote. Lakini inawezekana ukawa unojihusisha na kilimo cha mwani. Ukija kwetu pia utapata mkopo pasipo na riba. Inawezekana unataka kuingia kwenye ufugaji wa samaki kwa mfumo wa vizimba tunasema cage fish farming ukija kwetu utapata mkopo usio na riba tumeshapokea maombi zaidi ya nane yenye jumla ya watu zaidi ya sita na mpaka sasa hivi zaidi ya maombi nne yamepitishwa na tunanufaika zaidi ya 3200 asante sana fantastic um, tumebakiza chini ya dakika kumi. Uh, katibu mkuu naomba ujibu kwa kifupi sana lile swali la hifadhi uh, lilotoka embassy of ireland alafu tutatoa nafasi kwa maswali mawili ya mwisho because we are really pressed for time. Asante, thank you very much. Asante sana. Fazal, thank you very much. Fantastic question. Uh, we are still very grateful for the support we are receiving from the Irish Embassy through the IUCN program, the Great Blue Initiative and the Tanga Embassy Cap. How do we move from there? That is the uh, the, the uh, 1 million dollar question. We are trying very hard to ensure that our blue economy program goes hand in hand with marine conservation and we are literally increasing more marine spatial coverage which is going into the marine conservation areas with the Shimu Bahari program with the other blue action fund programs that are coming in into Pemba we are basically going to enact a new marine conservation area especially on the eastern seaboard of the Pemba island The question is how do we work together 
how does the government and development partners work together to scale up, for example, from $1.8 million uh, program to maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollar program? We'll very much be grateful to sit down and discuss about how do we work together, transition towards more level support programs, and I believe every embassy and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the government of Ireland are very much keen to support scaling up the program. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. So, two last questions, because I'm, I'm out of time. So the first question, uh, Sorry, I'm Pambele, Dr. Dr. Kirenga. My director, sorry, for, there are some clarification from the Minister Very briefly, Rebstock. very briefly, to Andalea Mshumawaziri, to Father. Asante sana. Kwa niyaba ya Wizara Mifugo no Vuvi, nilikuwa kidogo nataka ni respond na question ya Mr. Bakari. Anapo sembe, kwa nini tunafocus na vizimba kuliko... Uh, capture fisheries, particularly Please. in Lake Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, Mwishimu waziri kajibu vizuri, spokuwa nataka niongeze tu. Um, Bear in mind mudawe tu ume. Sawa. Kinacho fanyika kwa sasa ni kujaribu kusave hao sangara. Kwa tarifa tu ni kwa sababu ni kwa population inapungua ya sangara. Mfano, 20, the research of 2021-2022 it clearly inaonesha kwa stock imeshuka kwa 33%. And without, without proper intervention, how Sangara to not the mayor, what a potter. Now, percent of back katika stock here to society. Most of them, over 90, 80% ni Sangara wachanga. Kwa hiyo, definitely the population in our area ika potter. Kwa hiyo, kuna program in itwa Save the Nile Patch, kwa ajili ya kutoa vizimba, kwa lengo la kuboost hiyo population ya Sangara is to ili tuweze ku, ku export. Kwa hiyo policy ya wizara au ya serikali kwa sasa inafanya alternatively ya ku promote sato lakini lengo kubwa ni ku save population ya Sangara. Okay. Kama utaniruhusu kidogo ni ni, ni, ni wajibu taufa. Sawa. Taufa they are working very close na wizara na mlezi wao wa mwanzo ni Dr. Tamatama ambaye ni XPS. Thank you very much. Na sasa hivi mlezi wao ni mama mena ambaye ni naibu katibu mkuu. Tunacho ambia kwa sasa ni kwa sababu kuna ndani ya wizara kuna special desk kwa ajili ya private sector. Na lengo lake um, hili desk ni kuweza kufacilitate between banks na wizara. Na as we talk now kuna, kuna mjiasire ya mali moja raitwa Faisal ambaye kakopeshwa na CRDB zaidi ya milioni miya moja na hamsini. Kwa hiyo wizara inajenga ecosystem nzuri kati ya financial institutions na wajasiri ya mali including akina mama. Kwa hiyo tunakukaribisha sana na wananchi wote wizarani kuna special desk ambalo linaongozwa na Dr. Ambakise. They are doing very wonderful job kwa ajili ya kufasilita kwa wananchi. Asante sana. Asante sana. Uh, kwa hakika nitachukua maswali matatu ya mwisho. Kwa hivyo tutaanza hapa mbele swali moja kwa kifupi sana hapo Roy naofuatia swali la pili na swali la mwisho kwa dada kule ana wave kwa nguvu sana. Um, maswali yao mafupi kwa sababu hatuna muda kabisa. Tafadha. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm just curious to know if there is anything that is ongoing on the blue carbon opportunities. Blue carbon opportunities. Next on the line. Asante sana kwa Thank you very much, uh, moderator. My name is Dennis Simba, Tafiko CEO, Tanzania Fisheries Corporation. I'd like to allude to what the, the minister said. We are the commercial wing and we are here for you. We are here to partner to, with private sector on the mainland. So we have left the leaflets on your seats and after this I'll be meeting you. Thank you. Tafiko yupo kwa hivyo ata, ata kuwepo. Eh, Nikuwa nimetua na fasi kwa maswali matatu sala kwa kwa lita kuwa lane. Basi uliza alafu tuakwenda mwisho kabisa pale kwa dada. Asante sana kwa majina na itua Alpha. <coughs> Mkurugezi mtedanji wa kampuni ya Alpha Tanganika Flavor Limited. Nasikia hapa kwanza niombe serkali muna kuzungumuzia ziwa Victoria. Kumbukia ni kwamba ziwa Tanganika na lulipo. Kwa raka zaidi nataka kuzungumuza kuhusu tunajua vunaji wa, na, wa daga, samaki wadogo ambayo ni dagaa. Tumesikia watu wa Zanzibar umezungumuzia hilo na huku 
tunavuweza daga tunajua kwamba uvunaji wa hizo daga zinapotea asilimia stini, amsini na stini zinaharibika kipindi cha, cha mvua wakati watu wanavuna daga ndio wakati kipindi ambao daga unaonekana wengi lakini ndio kipindi ambapo wanapotea wengi asilimia ishirini inaenda kwa matumizi ya binadamu asilimia themanini, stini na themanini inaenda kwa kutengeneza chakula cha mifugo kwa sababu kinaharibika na sisi kama kampuni ya Alpha Tanganyika Flavor tulipata shida hiyo kwa sababu tuna export kwenda Marekani na tukaja na tukaja na solution kwa hiyo kama mnaweza kuona vipeperushi viko mezani tunabuni mashini ya kukausha dagaa na ya kubanika samaki tuna i, mashini yetu iko digitalized na iko modern inabanika samaki tani mbili kwa masaa sita inakausha dagaa vizuri kwa masaa matatu tani moja na nusu kwa hiyo hiyo ni solution kwa wamama wale ambao wanapoteza wanapoteza hapo post harvest kwa hivyo tunatushukuru kwa hiyo mnaweza kuangalia peperushi vipo swali la mwisho pale nyuma asante sana kwa kuniona maraki nafasi nimepigania sana kwa majina naitwa Deja Maribiche mimi natokea Mtwara Uh, mimi ni katibu wa Taufa, katibu mkuu wa Taufa. Taufa ni Tanzania Women Fisheries Association, yani ni mtandao wa wanawake tunaojishana shughuli za uvuvi, uchakataji pamoja na ukulima wa mwani. Swali langu nitajikita kwenye masuala ya aquaculture. Uh, kwenye aquaculture kuna ile swala la ulimaji wa mwani. Uh, ukiangalia wenzetu wa Zanzibar wako vizuri. Sawa, asante. Ngoja nialakishe. Ah, uh, swali langu linaenda kwa Tanzania bara. Uh, kuna uongezeko mkubwa sana wa wakulima wa mwani kuanzia Tanga mpaka Mtwara lakini sasa changamoto ambayo tuna, 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 ambayo tunayo kwamba huu kulima umekamatwa sana na mahajent agent ndio wamekumbatia sana agent anakuja anakupa taitai anakupa kamba lakini huyu agent ana masharti anakuambia kwamba anakupa hivi vifaa lakini nachotaka mimi uniuzie mimi mwenyewe usimuuzie mtu mwingine changamoto inakuja kwenye ile masharti kwamba yule ananunua kwa bei ambayo yeye anaitaka. Kwa hiyo hili sasa linatuumiza sana. Kwa hiyo Zanzibar wako vizuri. Hasa swali langu swala la, la broker wanaofionza. Eh yes. Nafikiri tumelipata. Yeah. Wacha lijibiwe. Eh eh. La mwisho ni kwa na kuna hili swala la ufugaji wa samaki kuna changamoto kubwa ya chakula. Chakula kinachokilicho kilichopo sio bora. Yaani kwanza kwanza kuna uaba lakini hata hicho kinachopatikana sio bora. Kwa hiyo pia kingine kuna masuala ya hivi vifaranga vya samaki. Vifaranga vya samaki navyo vipo lakini pia sio bora. Sasa serikali inatusaidiaje kuhakikisha kwamba chakula kinapatikana kwa wingi na bora lakini pia hata hao vifaranga vya samaki vinapatikana lakini viwe bora. Mfano nzuri mimi mwenyewe nafuga samaki kule Mtwara. Chakula ambacho tunanua utakuta chakula kinachokuja kwanza kina bei alafu pia sio bora utakuta kuna wadudu samaki wanapeleka hawa tumepata hawakuli. tumepata Asanteni context sana. kuna opportunity hapo kwenye hiyo changamoto na tuna push for private sector investment uhaba wa chakula maana yake ni kwamba kuna fursa ya kuinvest kwenye chakula uh, panelist wangu muda umekwisha very very briefly in a second or so kila mmoja wenu eh, ili tuweze kuondoka kwenye platform ili program nyingine ingie Asante. Kwa Blue Carbon ndio tuna program kama tatu nne ambazo ambazo zimekuwa in the pipeline. Program ya kwanza ni program ya mradi wa Tasfarm, mradi wa Benki ya Dunia, Tanzania uh, Culture and Fisheries uh, Management Program na mwezi wa Novemba wataalamu wa Wizara Mifugo na Uvuvi na wataalamu wa Wizara Uchumi wa Buluu na Uvuvi watafadhiliwa na Benki ya Dunia kwenda Accra Ghana katika kuanzisha ule mchakato wa, wa mpango maalum wa blue carbon katika utekelezaji wa program hii ya Tasfarm ya Benki ya Dunia. Under UNDP na program ya ya ya, ya Mombao na hii pia ipo ipo in a massive amount of uh, support. Katika issue ya Green Climate Fund GCF na kumbuka ni kwamba mwanzoni mwa mwaka huu Wizara ya Mifugo na Uvuvi ili ili submit application ya GCF kwenye muda mungana wa Tanzania ambayo ina involve wizara mifugo na uvuvi pamoja na wizara ya uchumi wa buluu kwa GCF kwa process lakini pia through private sector WCS ambayo hivi sasa wametengeneza another application inakwenda GCF ya masuala blue carbon na sisi 
Wizara ya Uchumi Buluu na Uvuvi tumewasiliana na afisa makamu wa rais wa Jamhuri ya Muungano wa Tanzania wa kuendoza application yao ili faida zote hizo zije kuwanufaisha wa Tanzania. Asante sana. Okay, one last uh, response. Tumalize. Ah, moderator and I want just to add hapo ambapo ameishia mkurugenzi mimi nazungumzia zaidi kwenye policy issues mm -hmm. kwenye swala la, la blue carbon uh, carbon trade uh, ni, ni kwamba ta, tayari tuna guideline ya Tanzania nzima ambayo imetayarishwa ambayo itatumika hadi Zanzibar lakini ili swala hili liweze kutekelezwa kwa Zanzibar tunahitaji tuwe na special regulation separate regulation ya Zanzibar sasa hivi tayari rasimu ya regulation imeshakamilika au naweza nikasema imeshakamilika isipokuwa tunahitaji kuiwasilisha serikalini with special circular sasa hivi tuko kwenye safari hiyo na tukipata baraka za serikali basi utekelezaji wa carbon trade utaanza Zanzibar na fortunately tuna, tuna, tuna national uh, forest reserve kama kumi Zanzibar hizo ziko chini ya serikali lakini tuna community forestry kama 67 kwa hivyo tupo tayari na karibuni sana. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for this session. Unfortunately, but let me just conclude by saying investing in the blue economy and blue foods will give us a double impact. We'll get into just food systems and a healthy planet. Thank you very much for being engaging participants. Asante sana. Um there's a delegate who has lost his hotel key card. He's a resident at Tiffany Diamonds Hotels. He may not be able to get back to the room, so please look around and see if you have lost one. It's here. Thank you very much. Santeni. Hi everyone. So the next session uh, that will take place here at Mount, Mount Meru is food systems in a time of crisis, youth, refugees, migrants and displaced people as part of the solutions. So please stick around and um, looking forward to it. And for the speakers of the next session, please take the front seats.
Hello, dear delegates. I would like to encourage you to take your seats because the next session is about to start.
Good morning. This is really, um, you know, the last day is always interesting. You have like 25 ongoing conversations you have to finish. You're running from one session to the next. You don't know if anyone's going to be in your room because half the people went out after the party last night and partied, right? Right? And some of you are laughing. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, my apologies. I was moderating <laughs> across another place and <laughs> they wanted to talk too much. But, you know, this is really the most important session of our week in many ways. We keep talking about crisis, compounded crisis, compounding crisis, as if it's kind of um, uh, somehow on the one hand fatalistic. We can't get out of the crisis mode. On the other hand, for some people, it's a distant problem, someone else's problem. It's not my own. On the other hand, some it's a future state which we're trying to avoid, like the climate crisis, even though it's upon us every day. But now, today, we want to talk about the human beings in that crisis, the people, the youth, the migrants, the livelihoods of women and children who are really struggling every day. You're the experts on this matter. I want to hear from each and every one of you. We hope to have a very engaging discussion, and we hope we draw in those people in the hallway who are still having coffee and chatting loudly. So, Now, um, as you all know, this is really uh, the Africa Food Systems Forum has been transiting from food productivity and really focusing on agronomy and seeds and fertilizer. And I think it's a really unique conversation for us to try and move away from some of the, the agronomy perspective, right, and pure agriculture. And when we start talking about it in greater food systems, oftentimes we focus during the Food Systems Summit in 2021 on consumers and consumer behavior. But if you're a consumer who's struggling for food and you're taking whatever food you can find on the run, how do we look at that differently? I think it's a conversation we haven't had enough I don't think we, 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 we rely on WFP, uh, in many cases, FAO, for data and statistics. Um, but sometimes those of us who are in those food systems need a bit more granularity. We want to hear more about solutions. We want to hear about how the different programs are effectively impacting the livelihoods um, of the youth, of the women, and also uh, from a systems perspective, displaced people, internally displaced people in the conflicts within the countries that we are actually talking about or not talking about. Again, I hope the coffee uh, reception outside um, joins us or finishes, but uh, we'll speak loudly anyway. Um, so without further ado, uh, and um, again, in the interest of opening a dialogue, you don't really need to hear from me. We want to hear from each of you. So... Can I invite to the stage our first panel, um, Mr. Stanley uh, Samkange, is that correctly pronounced? We'll work on it together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stanley. Uh, from WFP, as I mentioned, you can take any seat. Um, we have one less panelist this morning. Um, very pleased to invite Ada Osakawa, Osikwe. Sorry, I'm pronouncing her name. Uh, yes, please clap and tweet and cheer her. Um, Ada is our board member. She's uh, an entrepreneur. She's an investor. Uh, and so um, we really look to hear again uh, uh, both from the institutional side and the private sector uh, side of the systems dialogue. And then our third panelist, Mr. Bernard Hein, Regional Director for West and Central Africa for IFAD. Bernard, thank you so much for joining us. How do we fund all of these displaced people? So I am going to um, join you. Can you see well? This is a kind of a long room. It's okay? Um, Bernard, do you have a microphone? Shall we be using these ones, the handhelds? Sec sound tech team? Okay, you, you have both options. Great. So what I would propose is each of the panelists, since I have not introduced you fully and properly, you're welcome to make a few comments to introduce yourselves as, as you wish uh, to this great audience. 
but I would also like to ask you each a question as you go through and introduce yourselves. And I will start out with you, Mr. Sunley. Um, so the World Food Program has extensive experience, I think that's an understatement, in uh, crisis management, crisis response, in logistics, in supply chains, uh, and one of my favorite dis discussions with World Food Program in local sourcing uh, of ingredients for all of the food that you distribute. Uh, and now how do you see uh, your evolvement, the changes, the pivots, uh, in terms of responding to this compounded crisis that we're in with regard to displaced people, and of course youth in particular, as a catalyst to longer term sustainable food security. Now that is like a thesis paper in a question, so we'll see how he manages. I didn't write it, but um, we'll see. I think you can say anything with response to that. <laughs> Over to you, Stanley. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, actually I'm very happy to have this question. Maybe let me introduce myself first. I'm Stan Lake Samkange. I'm the Senior Director for Strategic Partnerships in WFP. I oversee our engagement with international financial institutions, with the African Union, with our sister agencies in Rome, FAO and IFAD, uh, with relations with China, and issues uh, such as the G20. Uh, I, I, it's a very important question you ask, and I actually want to focus on the aspect related to youth. Um, uh, <clears throat> and I want to make two points in particular. The first point, which is really the, I think, the most fundamental point, is that our main objective in crises uh, with respect to youth is to make things as normal as possible for youth. These are people who are in abnormal situations, who are either who are displaced, they are not in normal context, often they are uprooted from both communities, from social networks, from other things. The biggest challenge uh, and the most important thing, I think, is to actually make life as normal as possible for people in those situations. That's why also, for example, we place such a, a high emphasis on school meals, uh, in a sp including in emergency contexts. Of course, there's the aspect of ensuring that people have adequate food and nutrition, but there's also the aspect of ensuring that they are able to continue with their education, that education is something that uh, is prioritized when people are in these uh, kind of contexts and school meals, we see that as a contribution, uh, not just as a safety net, but also to help ensure that uh, especially young people are not uprooted and are not disconnected from the education system, which is in the long run their biggest opportunity, that is their, their future. So in, uh, uh, anything we can do to ensure that conditions are as normal as possible for people in abnormal situations is really the priority for us. Uh, beyond that, uh, and in terms of what kinds of things you can do, uh, especially with youth and for youth uh, and by youth in those kinds of situations, uh, you know, we, we should first recognize that this is a broader challenge. Uh, it's not just youth who are in uh, refugee, migrant, or displaced situations that this is an issue for. This is a broader issue, even youth in normal situations. Uh, how do you cre help create job opportunities? How do you make agriculture and other things interesting for youth? How do you en en enable people to unleash their talents, their uh, opportunities. This is a, a broader challenge for all of us in the development space, but it's even more difficult for people who are displaced migrants or refugees. One of the things that we have tried to do is focus on, again, that l learning, that education, that training aspect, especially digital skills. So we have in a number of places, um, I know in Lebanon and, and uh, several other places in the Middle East, we've tried to focus on 
uh, supporting people to have access to digital equipment and digital technology on the one hand, but then also to build digital skills. Uh, and this is, it's been, I think, reasonably successful. We've done it on a fairly small scale, uh, but it's, I, I think this is, for me, the, an area of real opportunity, because the future anyway is, is digital. So can, I, people can I just ask, um, because yeah. this is, I think, a, a, of interest to many people in many, in, when you say small, you know, so for some of us, it might be gigantesque. Can, can you be a bit, you know, because give us a few numbers. How many youth are we talking about? And, and you know, if this is working, what would it take to scale it up? I believe in, uh, in the, one, the program I'm most familiar with was in Lebanon, where we had uh, working also, I think, with the World Bank in Lebanon and in Syria. We worked uh, with, I think it was 6,000 youth. To, so, no, it, it's um, not insignificant, but still, compared to the scale of the needs, uh, it's fairly small, and we did it as a pilot to see, does it make sense? Does it make sense to try and build digital skills and opportunities for people, and can you actually link them to job markets? Uh, and the thing that is actually quite uh, useful and important about that in this context that we're, we're talking about today is that uh, it's a way of overcoming, well, let's say, some of the borders, the geographic, uh, and the physical constraints that especially youth in conflict, uh, migratory, and displaced situations are facing. Uh, it matters what the, uh, where you are and what the environment is. In many uh, situations, uh, people are not allowed to work. They're not allowed to work in the places where they are uh, seeking refuge or where they, they are temporarily located. Uh, and so actually being able to provide digital skills and to have a digital connectivity is also a way of uh, overcoming some of these obstacles that uh, may be existing or imposed on, on people in particular communities. I'm going to come back to that. This is so interesting. I want the whole, you know, report and analytics and what did they do? How did it work? I mean, how much did it cost? I have like a thousand questions, but I can't answer them right now. So just hang on to that. We'll come back to it. Um, but you have such a vast vision and mandate for, for uh, the challenge and the opportunity, and, and we want to really learn from your experience. Um, but in the meantime, I'm going to go to um, Ada. Uh, because it's really just fun to hear from everybody so many different interesting perspectives and experience on such a challenging topic. Um, and Ada is, is Nigerian, and a lot of people don't talk about Nigeria as a, a, a country and a challenge and a crisis, but in a, in a growth, uh, economic growth, powerhouse of food and policy reform, you know, so many interesting things happening in Nigeria, and yet it is um, a very huge security challenge as well. We know that, uh, and the pressures, of course, of all the neighboring countries. So, um, you know, Ada, I, I think it would be great as a youth advocate, um, because, uh, by the way, I have a new slogan. Did you hear this, Ada? We're young at heart. I am not okay. youth, but I'm young at heart. Oh, I just nice. want you to know. So um, <laughs> this is the, the tagline for our, uh, for our outcome here, is young at heart. So. As a youth advocate, Ada, um, can you share about innovation and entrepreneurship among refugees and migrants uh, and uh, internally displaced youth, um, but relative to the agri-food system's specific challenge, and, and how do you see uh, the impact and the opportunities in that space? Yeah. No, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Vanessa. Um, yesterday I was in, in that presidential um, room where they were, they were talking and, and having really interesting presentations on Tanzania and the things that were happening. And there were these young um, people who were singing, right? Lovely performance. Um, and what was showing on the back on the screen when some of the youths were singing was just very poignant for me. Um, there was this picture or video of a young woman holding you know, two children and speaking in a language, a local language, um, saying how you know, they were displaced, right? There was hunger and she had to look, grab the kids she saw playing around and run, right, and flee um, and move away from the crisis that was developing. And she lost two kids in the process. She still can't find them. 
and my heart just went out. You know, I was just like, this just can't keep happening. Not in the t in the world we live in today. When on the flip side, there's still so much wealth um, and opportunities. So I look at that, and and it's children, young people, that are the heart of the conflict and being um, affected in a negative way. And as you look at the refugee crisis, you know, over half of those refugees, you know, the 20 million or so we have in, in Africa are people under the age of 18. They are young people. They are the youths we speak about. And I met some of them when I came out here, um, I think five years ago, I went to the Kakuma refugee camp um, in Kenya. Um, I went with the World Economic Forum at the time, and we spent about a week with the UNHCR um, hosting us and just visiting and, and speaking with the young people. I met them. I, I learned about their dreams, their aspirations. They were all so bright, right? Majority of them were just like, they had the energy, um, and, and they just had these big, big dreams to, to make a difference in their lives, right? Um, and to get out of the rot, to get out of the cycle of poverty. Um, but ultimately, the ugly side to that is that those dreams are not typically realized. It's untapped opportunity. Um, it's an untapped opportunity and potential, I feel, um, because you have those teeming youths out there in the camps, right? They want to do things, but they're constrained they're constrained by certain laws. You know, you can't get work permits, or people can't employ them, or they're not trained, or they don't have the digital skills and the tools. So it was just compounded. And I, you know, I'm a private sector person. I've been an entrepreneur for the last seven years, and my mind is like going, asking questions, asking, okay, what's the size of this market? How do I size this? What's the opportunity? What's the adjustable market from an economic standpoint? How can we truly tap into this? How can we attract people who do have the money to come in here and see this as an opportunity to invest and lift folks out, these young people out of poverty and truly allow them to realize those dreams and those bright, bright um, aspirations. At the time, it was 2018, I think the IFC had just brought out their study on Kakuma as a marketplace. So it was the first time we were saying, okay, this is nearly a $50 million market opportunity you know, and they did a survey. They had about 15% of the businesses in the camp that identified as entrepreneurs. Then when you peel those layers back and entrepreneurs who maybe own the Dukas, the retail stores and things like that, you peel or the Impesa points, you peel that back and you still found that nearly 50% of the owners were from the host community, were Kenyan, and they typically were not employing the refugees. So it's just layers and layers of things. So you truly have to, I think the first learning there was how do we keep peeling through the surface of research and the data and, and really digging deep by, by truly asking those, those right questions. Um, but then it was just entrepreneurship truly is one of the biggest ways out of this because they couldn't get the work permits, they can't get employed, um, so what do they do? So as I think about it in the agri-food context, you know, there I was thinking, can't we have greenhouses here? You know, I know FAO went on to do some work in that space, um, you know, setting up greenhouses where there's horticulture projects. Because back in that specific area, it's in the Turkana County, so it's quite arid. It's very dry, you know, so it's how do we still, do you still get places they can truly get serious um, yield from, from tomatoes or from, from, from spinach or whatever? Um, so, so I felt that was one big opportunity. But, but one that I really saw was how do we employ or utilize these refugees and the settlements they're in as a supply of agricultural produce to the marketplace? So how do we link them in the food system? Um, there was a really great um, example from Uganda, I think the Bidi Bidi um, settlement where I think it's Afia Porridge, some of you may have heard of them, it's a social impact enterprise. And they were employing young women in the refugee camps to grow mushrooms and millet and sorghum and sourcing from them to add to their you know, high nutrient porridge product that they then went on to use to give um, pregnant women, I think about a 1,000 pregnant women, a 1,000 kilograms of of produce was sourced from the from the refugees, and you know, giving this high nutrient dense um, porridge to, to truly help their immunity and, and transform issues around um, malnutrition. 
So for me, that's just a, a clear example, right? S your, your supply of agricultural produce potentially coming from the refugees and linking it to markets, linking it to jobs. Don't just train them, link it to jobs. I keep saying training is not jobs. We talk about training so much, but it's at the end of the day, link it to jobs. Um, and then the second thing I'll think of, you know, I have a chain of farm to table restaurants back in Nigeria. We source from farmers and we add value in the form of juices, our food, you know, we have cassava waffles, for example, because we grow 40 million metric tons of cassava in Nigeria, but we don't add value to it. So it's, we're using the flour, we use fonio, things like that. Can you do those so, frozen? I think I need some <laughs> in my house. Is that like cassava so, waffles? So for me, a second thing I'll think of around, you know, potentially franchising existing businesses that have already been proven. Because you know, you, we talk entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship for young people, but there's still a high failure rate when it comes to entrepreneurship. So don't, I know there's mentorship around it. I know there's potentially training, but sometimes the business model just was never gonna work or the market environment was just not gonna be as suitable for that business or at the time. So how do we take models that have worked that are operational, that have proven their business model, and then scale them um, in these settlements, um, providing them the entire structure of the business. And we're doing that at Newly, um, not with refugees yet at, in West Africa, but I'll talk about that uh, maybe later in the conversation. But those are just two things I can think of um, in the agri-food context um, as, we, as we think about engaging young people um, in these settlements, thanks. Wow, I have like 101 more questions and ideas, and I hope you're all busy keeping notes, tweeting your suggestions and ideas, you know, arguing with us virtually because that's the only way you can talk right now because I hold the mic, so just go for it. Um, but uh, uh, Bernard, you know, um, I don't know if I should use a French accent for your name, but it's more interesting. Um, Bernard Hein is the Regional Director of West and Central Africa for IFAD. Uh, you know, IFAD is a, is a mystery to a lot of people. So can you break this down, you know, in practical terms? Because I, ADA has given us so many ideas, incubators, startups, social entrepreneurship, and refugee camps, you know, um, taking digitalization, getting to markets. Can you build on the other two speakers' great uh, input and, and ideas? And give us a little bit, I, uh, you know, IFAD's also always evolving, and we appreciate uh, with um, President Hongbo's leadership as well, how many different innovations you've been doing also in the climate space, uh, which may be reducing the longer term uh, uh, potential um, tidal waves, right, of youth uh, refugees. So just give us some of your ideas around the agri-food space because you're financing and funding food and ag uh, uh, across, um, across Africa and, and how do you see some um, innovations, uh, some, some line light at the end of this really, really grueling tunnel uh, that we're all talking about, which is constant uh, growing um, compounding crises? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Actually, I was in a previous session and I was saying that we are not talking enough about fragility in this AGRF. Whereas the transformation we are talking about is happening, you know, in mostly fragile contexts. And I was happy when you were introducing this session when you mentioned that actually this is one of the most important sessions because of the crisis we are talking about. And crisis is also a determinant of fragility. So it's really important. I concur with you. And I'm going to perhaps uh, address your point with a, a regional perspective, the West and Central Africa a region. Uh, starting with what is the scope of what we are talking about when we are saying migrant, we are saying refugees, we are saying internally displaced people, what it is about. Only last year, 11 million people were concerned by displacement in West and Central Africa. This represents about 10% 10, 10 of the population. When you look at uh, the internally displaced people, there were about 8 million people. When you look at the refugees, there were about 2 million. You take a country like Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso, three years ago, you had 
in our, I mean, as per our assessment, because we are having operation, we had about 50,000 people were internally displaced. That was three years ago. And recently, when you check this, it was over 2 million people as a result, you know, of the conflict, the crisis going on. 3,000 schools closed. 600,000 kids out of school without future. You look at Nigeria, same thing. As a result of the insurgency of Boko Haram, over 3 million people internally displaced. So this is what we are talking about here. So they are extremely vulnerable, and that's why IFAD, as per his mandate, we are trying to really include them, to involve them in our work, in our program of work. Now, concretely, uh, what we are doing, uh, we started, you mentioned President Humbo, who was very, very, very concerned by the topic. So we started reframing a little bit, even at the corporate level, the way we address the matter. So we came up with this uh, youth action plan, youth action plan to sort of create the framework for us to tailor the operations, to tailor the way we target those youth in our project design. So this was the first thing we did. And after this, we made sure that actually the organization to translate this into action, we committed ourselves during the period 2020 to 2024 to actually target to have youth sensitive project in 60% of our operations. And this include internally displaced youth, it include migrants, it includes refugees. So this is an organizational step we made to it. Now concretely on the ground, when we are implementing, what we do, we do about it? We use a youth sensitivity lens to make sure that the challenges they are facing, for example, we are here talking about internally displaced migrants and so on. In addition to the existing challenges in the host community, they face additional challenges, for example, the access you know, to land, the um, uh, it, it skills, uh, the, 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 the capacity they do not have, the access to finance, many things. So in, uh, to address these challenges, so what we do in those operations, we make sure that, for example, vocational training you know, is part of it, trying to address you know, their need. We make sure that all the needs in terms of access to services, to finance, you know, is provided. And basically, this is helping them. She was saying that it's not just about training, it's also about linking the training to job. So we make sure that we will not get this job, it will not have access to the finance. So these are the things we are trying to cover under our, under our operation and to also make sure that mentorship is provided because from experience, you will just train, you will provide the financing. If the mentorship is not there to make the business viable after three years, it will go down. This is our experience. So to us, business development, entrepreneurship, is the way to it, and not only for normal youth, but also for the migrant, the internally displaced people. Just, just to, you mentioned this uh, 2024, you know, action plan for youth, right? And 60% uh, uh, youth sensitivity. I mean, uh, I kind of get nervous when I hear gender sensitivity. I don't know if I'm included because, you know, it, is it for me or is it not for me, right? Is, is it? So how much funding changed? Can you give us some numbers? Were you, are you even close to reaching that 60% mark? Did, did you really change the, the nature of the, the programs? Uh, definitely, uh, when we say 60% youth sensitive, which means that we have a number of criteria. For example, when a project is being designed, so how much financing in that project is being allocated to youth sensitive activities, you see. But we even went further. We went further to say, okay, to have what we call now the second generation of youth project. We are talking about incubation. Now we are designing project by the youth for the youth. You see? Now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking, right? Okay, this is getting serious. Uh, an example I will give to you is in Cameroon, where we have this uh, youth uh, entrepreneurship program, agro-pastoral youth entrepreneurship program, where we brought together UNDREF youth, representative of the 10 provinces of Cameroon, who reflected with head of agencies, 
with senior government officials discussing what are the challenges, what is preventing them to engage you know, in food systems. Uh, based on this, we move ahead to take their challenges and to transform this into a project designed by themselves. We put $60 million on this project. It's taking them with NGOs on the ground, assessing the ideation, the idea generation with the youth, selecting them, putting them into the incubation process. And 12 incubators were established. What we've done also here is that when we discussed with the youth, one of the challenge was that the training were just technical training. It was not business oriented. So we also uh, develop the capacities of those incubation center to add the business orientation and those youth when they enter these centers with their project idea they are able to mature it to get exposed to real business situation and then they are connected to microfinance institution and they start implementing their business with the support of business advisors for one to three years so this is what for example we are doing specifically great, great. Wonderful. I say great because, you know, for those of us who have been in this kind of training mode, we know that the training sometimes just doesn't go anywhere. And you could spend all your money training and then nothing happens. You don't have jobs, you don't have employment, you don't have entrepreneurs, you certainly don't have profitability. Uh, so, you know, I'm happy to hear you talking about business advisors and, and kind of follow on mentorship. And the data has actually shown that if you compound training with mentorship and networking, right? Because then you can have mentorship and still be in your same circle. But when you grow the network, that's when the business opportunities really start to have fruition. But I want to come back to this. If you allow, mm. training mentorship alone is not enough. When you train, before even mentoring, you have to allow the business to start. From experience, when you train and you do not provide the access to the finance for the business to start within one year, you know, your survival rate become around 10 to 15 percent of the idea. However, if you are able to make this connection with the finance and then now to add the mentorship, quickly you can go up to 60, 75 percent of survival. I love formulas. That's, you guys all got that, right? Don't, the return on investment of adding the access to finance, then followed by the mentorship, 60 to 70 percent. That's better than in the U.S., you know, I'm just saying. We have to talk about this. Okay, so, um, uh, Stan Lucky, you know, uh, uh, you, World Food Program has this innovation, digitization um, hub that I, I've heard about and, and talked to um, uh, in, and uh, World Food Program is also committed to local procurement, and yet you have this, you know, what we hear about all the time, not enough funding just to feed people that are in the network who are displaced. Um, so how do you balance between innovating, uh, you know, local sourcing, um, and then, again, the, 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 the epic uh, growing compounded crises that you're managing? And... Um, can you just give us the, the, some of your formulas? Because let's go away from here and say, okay, what's actionable? What can we take away from your experience? How do we partner better? Which is what we're here about, right? The Food Systems uh, uh, Forum is about partnership. So if, if anyone in the room wants to partner with you, what are the opportunities for them as well? Uh, most people know WFP as a Most people know WFP is a big humanitarian organization, uh, largest humanitarian organization in the world. What they don't know is that when WFP was created uh, for the, in 1961, for the first uh, 20 years of our existence, we were focused on development. N 90 un until the early 80s, 90% of WFP's work was on development. That started to change with the Ethiopia famine when we got brought in and through the 1980s there were a series of natural and human made disasters that uh, engaged us more and more to uh, support responses. By the end of the 1990s, WFP was 90% focused on emergencies. It had entirely flipped. Uh, since then, the pendulum has 
moved back a little bit, and we've actively tried to move the pendulum back uh, <coughs> towards a better balance. Today, uh, out of, let's say, t operations of about 10 billion a year, two-thirds of that is still focused on direct, immediate life saving, things that are needed to keep people alive. That's two-thirds of our program of work. But a third of our program of work is focused on longer-term resilience and on addressing the root causes. Yeah. And uh, this uh, increasingly, as crises have grown, as the numbers have increased, uh, actually the only way to bring down these big humanitarian numbers is to invest more and to focus more on the resilience and the root causes. <coughs> Otherwise, these humanitarian numbers will just continue to increase, and it's unsustainable. No? Uh, so w we have tried actively to focus m uh, in not just on the saving lives, which has to be done, but on the ways to mitigate crises when they uh, are, are occurring, and on the things that you can do in the middle of a crisis to um, help move people towards longer term and better situations and circumstances. Yeah. And that is very much a focus of our work. We were discussing earlier with one of the ministers in Tanzania, um, engagement on um, livelihoods. For us, jobs are critical. If people don't have jobs, they can't be food secure. So that's why we are very focused on what can you do to help create jobs? How do we as WFP use our big footprint, local procurement, other types of things to create jobs and growth and employment? Uh, local procurement, we, our board allows us to pay 20% more than international prices if we can buy locally, if we can procure locally. In, in Africa, we buy over $500 million a year locally uh, in Africa. We try and buy that as much as possible from smallholders. I believe in here in Tanzania, we, we normally procure about $50 million a year from dollars uh, a, a year. Uh, from Tanzanian farmers, 25% of that is from smallholder farmers directly. Uh, but we do it in a way that's not just designed to procure, but that's designed to create jobs and employment and value all along the value chain. So we're not just a commercial buyer. No, we, we are a development buyer in that, um, in that sense. And, and I, 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 uh, but I, I want to go back to, and, and in, in this context, of course, we do try and look for opportunities for local uh, jobs, local production, especially for, for youth employment, um, entrepreneurship, encouraging creativity, wherever this is possible, we do invest in that. So I get to be the tough guy for a minute because um, here I am representing Agra and our partnership here. And shouldn't WFP be one of our core partners of this forum? Don't you all think that would be an obvious partnership for a partnership guy? I'm just putting you on the spot. But we're here. We're here. We're here. Showing up is half the battle. That took us a couple years. Next is, you know, stay in here. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, uh, the numbers in Tanzania. So I work with WFP very closely on the Farm to Market Alliance. I'm actually on the steering committee with, um, you know, JP and... Uh, we, we um, uh, see the WFP local procurement opportunities, right? Um, do any of you know how much maize Tanzania produces? Do you? It's got to be a Tanzanian ag person in the room. It's between three to five million tons a year, right? And they can double that with more market easily, huh? Easily. In dollar term? In dollar terms, please tell me. I'm just asking. Well, if you just take your average $300 a ton, which it's not right now, it's closer to $400 a ton, you can do the math, right? So 300, you guys are the mathematicians. I'm, I'm supposed to be. 
It's in the bill. It's a billion dollar industry, right? So I'm just saying, we need to get that equation moving in a way which is, which, you know, we don't want to have uh, refugees who need this uh, food, but we don't want to create new refugees also because the ones who are growing food can't actually find markets and sell it. So there's an equation here to, to that's just the Tanzania model. I worked on this with your team also in Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia went from producing only about a million tons of maize to now being one of the largest producers on the continent uh, with Nigeria, of course, five million tons of maize uh, in Ethiopia. And one year we did supply 50,000 tons to WFP out of three million tons. So there's more work that we need to do uh, on figuring out those market structures and supply and demand um, so that we get the numbers to, to, to work. And the youth uh, employment, as you all know, is exactly where we want to go. Just growing food isn't going to be enough. That's not, that's not where anybody wants to stay. But most of that production is for local consumption. You know, so, and, and we are very careful when we buy. We are not uh, allowed to distort markets. You know, we don't want to go into the market and raise prices for everybody. So we buy when there are surpluses, and, and we've been working with the government of Tanzania, in fact, to be able to procure more, because our needs are much bigger. Uh, so, but there are constraints that go beyond what are, what's been produced, what we were discussing with the minister earlier today, and, and what we're working with the government of Tanzania on is also the supply chain. Yeah? Actually, he was complaining that there are sardines and other commodities r rotting because they can't be moved and, and uh, the, the marketing is really a critical part and this is a big part of what WFP also does and, and contributes and that's how you, you link the smallholder farmers to the broader opportunities. The reason it's, it's called Farmers to Market Alliance is that people can produce but then where is the market and unless you focus on that market uh, and the things that are needed to enable people to get the benefit of what they are producing, including value addition, you're not going to make progress. That's just like a, you know, a segue, like you could never want a better segue to ADA, right? You're, t you're talking about the entrepreneurs, the market opportunities, um, and, and, you know, how do we foster more youth entrepreneurs, whether it be in uh, refugee camps or uh, internally displaced people or at the root cause level like Bernard was saying so that the underlying dynamics in the markets actually encourage people to want to stay right and and or go back if they have to leave and come back home so you know what have you seen uh, Ada and um, you know in your view what are the numbers Bernard is talking about finance access to finance and we know how costly that can be for small businesses and how inaccessible commercial loans are for many people by the way, there's a new study we just released, and hopefully we can share it with all of you, where we surveyed SMEs, uh, 1,600 SMEs across the continent over the last couple months about the effect of the compounded crisis on their financials and the fragility, the liquidity issues, and the constraints that they've uh, encountered. And so that maybe can come as an input to this discussion. Yeah, no, <clears throat> absolutely. So, you know, the youth continue to be the driver of of growth for our economies to take us out of you know, the, the crisis. Uh, we really have to focus on youth. Um, but I'll go a layer deeper again and, and bring out issues around women and, and girls within, within that demographic as well. Um, because women truly are the foundation of our food security. 75% um, of the labor force in ag, 80% um, of, produ of, of pr production of what actually comes out um, but then you look at, at the end of the day, the aspects of the business side of agriculture, where truly that's where the wealth creation lies. So I feel like we can't have this conversation without talking about women. According to the UNHCR, women and girls account for half of those refugees. So, 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 so let's go deeper on that. And, and when we do, specifically on, on the ag side, 18% they earn 18% less <laughs> than men in the farming space. Six times less capital when it comes to financing. Six, ti six times less likely, rather, to get financing than men. So we don't even have the money 
to build those businesses. I'm a female entrepreneur in the ag space, and I know how difficult, even with my background in finance, MBA, whatever, in ag, it's still so tough to have those conversations. The biases are real. They exist. I've experienced it. Um, so we really need to be very intentional um, about our focus on women. We have to be so deliberate. Um, and I, I have no apologies. One of the pro projects we are designing, or we, we actually launched um, last year, and we have funding from a large foundation, is back to that point on franchising I raised earlier on. We've been doing our business for seven years. We've scaled out our farm-to-table cafes. Um, so I was like, you know, we keep getting requests. Can we get a franchise? Can we actually pay you to take your model um, and set it up somewhere else that you're not so that we can make money out of it? And I was like, you know, I want to design this, but I want to do it in an intentional way. So how do I get young women, only women, to apply, not guys, to be owners of my type of business that already has the playbook, and I'll layer it on with mentorship. I'll layer it on with training. For the first six months, they only train. Then they get the funding as a 0% grant, repayable, so they have the discipline to pay back and it's not some sort of moral hazard that you see so much in the donor community. Oh, let's just give them money. And then those, what do they do with it? We have to be, we have to start looking at, and, you know, really looking at the financing structures and the architecture around donor funding um, towards young people. And then they set up the business, they get started before the mentorship comes. You start seeing while you're still there watching them and then the mentors come in. Hey, how did you do today? How did you market? Where did you, you know, source from? Are you having any issues with supply, um, getting supplies of the pineapples you need for that juice? How have you thought about it? Go back to the drawing board. But they're actually hands-on, roll up your sleeves, putting things into practice. Not just training and then saying, how are you gonna link to the job later on? It's a, a, a closed loop system. And at the end of the day, they get ownership of that business. Let's talk about ownership. Let's talk about equity. They own that and they can use that as collateral down the line. So that at the end of the day, it's not just about jobs. It's about safe jobs. It's about dignified jobs. It's about stable jobs. And on my final point on stability, and I want to truly stress it, we talk about unemployment rates amongst youth in Africa. At the end of the day, it's still about 10, at least according to the data, 10.6% unemployment. It's still lower than the global youth average of about 13%. But when you then pull back the layers, we have 79%, according to the ILO, International Labor Organization, 79% vulnerable employment. Self-employed. Oh, my family member gave me a job. No stable wages. It's not recorded. It's not in the formal economy. So we need to look at the kinds of jobs. At the end of the day, when we do the training and we link them up, entrepreneurship, not just for the sake of entrepreneurship, it has to be stable, it has to be safe, and it has to be dignified. Thanks. Wow. So much to think about peeling layers back. And we have a whole other panel. So Bernard, you get the last word on this panel. And we're going to move to our next panel really quickly. Um, but uh, and in the meantime, as the other panel comes up, uh, we might switch things around and get some audience questions um, before uh, uh, that. But um, Bernard, you know, uh, again, just last word. You've heard all of this interesting ideas and some challenges, and um, you've been in the landscape probably longer than any of us uh, seeing different things. And, and I think Ada's point is, 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 is something you, you express, right? Using the funding that's available in an effective way, right? Uh, and, and, and in a way which catalyzes change. Because we're tired. Aren't we tired? We're tired of talking about these things in a very depressing and you know, overwhelming statistics going in the wrong direction. So give us some energy, give us some solutions. Let's wrap this panel up with some lessons from uh, the way forward. 
Yeah, perhaps the energy will come from, I mean, a quick, uh, I mean, example or best practices, you know, that will come in mind. But if I can build quickly on what she just mentioned, she was talking about, you know, the jobs, you know, they have to be, I mean, stable and so on. It's indeed very important. I'll, I'm going to use the word decent, decent jobs. This is important, and that's why when we are working on entrepreneurship development, business development in agriculture, there is a dimension that we should never forget, the policy aspect. As we are supporting business development, how are we ensuring that you know the policy environment is also favorable for those jobs, you know, for the business to flourish? We did this uh, in one of the countries where we're trying to launch, actually, to promote um, uh, youth-led businesses in the agri-value chains. And then we realized that, you know, the policy and that there was actually nothing, you know, specific to agriculture. So we partnered with ILO to actually do a one-year-long work to establish this framework to allow that so that in three, five years terms, you know, the businesses we are promoting we're going to be able to flourish. So it's okay, very let's take that study and use it for other countries. So another, we have like four documents we have to share out of this, but we want that one. Okay. In terms of quick examples, I would say what comes to my mind. Uh, I was in a country where we, we promoted actually 5,000 youth-led businesses, and one of them that came to my mind when I see I mean youth in poultry with 5,000. I mean with contract, you know, contract with the Hilton, the Hilton Hotel, uh, providing the Hilton Hotel with chickens. Uh, I see, I mean, another uh, uh, group of youth, technology. Yesterday, the minister of the UAE was talking about technology. And she was saying, actually, she used it, she preferred to use the term agro-technologies, which is so true. Seeing youth, actually, from the rural house, they are able to activate using their phone, you know, a system, an irrigation system, you know, to water their vegetable. This is something, a success I've seen in our project. And also going on Facebook themselves, we used to establish those uh, 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 information system, you know, to allow marketing on agri product. Those youths, they don't care about this anymore. They go on Facebook, they market their own produce, and seeing them, you know, having contract with big supermarket like Carrefour and so on, this is a good practice. I was a month ago in Benin, and then uh, we were visiting, uh, uh, I mean, uh, a district where we supported the development of uh, 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 lands for rice production, and the entire value chain, the way it was set up by youth, I mean, it was just amazing with the latest technologies and a firm contract with server. And I told the president of Benin, we're just gonna tweet from here that the rice you might be eating on Air France is produced by youth in a NIFAD, you know, in a NIFAD funding project. So a firm contract, they are producing, you know, processing, packaging, selling, you know, to server and is being cooked for Air France. These are examples. Brilliant. Thank you so much to this panel and um, really this uh, everything from policy to um, practical examples and uh, a few a few challenges uh, to, to take us moving forward. So please give them a huge round of applause. And um, we're out of time for the Q&A, but what I suggest is that you go run and get their cards and uh, follow them in the hallways. Uh, let's let's uh, continue the discussions. Uh, and while we welcome the next panel to the stage, thank you so much. Great. This, um, so uh, now we want to, to hear from some cooperatives. So we have uh, Mr. Kaitare Shema. Uh, from uh, the cooperative uh, Kodig Kodiga Cooperative. Are you here? No, I'm not seeing him. And Alice Zamushkosha? Another no? Oh, okay. We might go back and do more Q&A then. Um, and Anthony Mahangama? 
Thank you. All right, great. Well, at least, we, you know, you might get all the questions. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And he's program manager at IUCN. And um, Mahadi Hassan. Wonderful. Please come and join us. Excellent. So, wow, you have a whole committee of uh, a clan of supporters. So, so great. This is going to be energetic. Now, if any of our other speakers felt like they should come back on stage, you're, you know, you're welcome. But uh, we're just going to dive in here. Now, this is going to be interesting. This is a whole different look. Let's hear about uh, uh, each of your um, endeavors. And IUCN, of course, does everybody know what IUCN is? You're going to have to help us out because this is, um, I was, tell one of our board members told me that we should stop um, producing reports that have four pages of acronyms at the four <laughs> word of the report. So IUCN is on the four pages of acronyms that um, requires an explanation. But really what we want to hear from you in particular is, is how you work with uh, refugees, migrants, um, in the food systems context. Because everybody's had to rethink, uh, I think, over the past few years as we, we, we challenge ourselves towards uh, realizing that, you know this, food systems contributes 35% at least, if not more, to climate change. So we can't just keep doing the same old things, right? So in addition to the crises that we've been challenging ourselves with, and we have refugees and youth migrants, uh, you must have had to pivot some of the things that you're doing, and this is what we really want to hear, what's innovative, um, and Anthony, we hope that you're going to, to challenge us with some of the scale of the challenges that you see every day. Is the mic on? That one works. You want this one? You can oh, I will use this one, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. So my name is, uh, as moderator has introduced, Anthony Mahagama, and I work with IUCN. IUCN is um, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. It's actually a global network um, of conservation uh, organizations, of government, um, civil society organizations, uh, non-government organizations, so these are some of uh, members of um, IUCN. Um, IUCN has got um, a number of um, scientific uh, commissions uh, that works in uh, various um, areas of interest. And for the moment we have um, around uh, seven commissions and we also do operate um, of uh, 1,400 members uh, globally and I represent uh, the Tanzania office, which is part of the um, East, and Af East, uh, East African regional office, which is based in Nairobi. So speaking of migration and youth and refugees, I think this is um, quite um, an important topic, as previous speakers um, had underlined. And um, the IUCN's Commission for Environment and uh, Economic and Social Policy um, estimates that migration uh, will keep on increasing. So the problem that we are seeing now, the magnitude uh, will, keep on, uh, will keep on increasing if we really don't take measures to, to, address, uh, to address the challenge. But many times when we talk about um, migration, when we talk about food systems, when we talk about uh, food security, we mainly refer to, uh, to we as people. We often forgot, forget um, other creatures, other species uh, that we do coexist um, in the earth that we are, we are living. And I'm saying this because um, IUCN is also um, monitoring through what we call the red list um, a number of species um, uh, currently, the red list has got uh, something around uh, 100, 150,000 species that are being monitored. 
And out of that, um, approximately 30%, uh, they are being threatened of extinction. So these are some of the issues that are actually being accelerated by um, widespread land uh, degradation and also climate change. So whenever we talk about uh, food systems, we need to think of um, other species that we, that we do co coexist. And in terms of our experience uh, working with the refugees, I have some few examples where we really have seen that this group is actually also very key. If we are to transition to um, sustainable food systems, if we are to regenerate, if we are to repair the damage that has already been done um, on, on, on environment, on ecosystems, and on uh, biodiversity. So we had worked um, in Bangladesh, in, 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 in Rohingya uh, refugees community. We had worked with the UNHCR, and um, there we had worked with communities to address um, human uh, elephants conflicts. They were actually widespread, and therefore through integration and working with uh, refugees and also host communities, um, through that program we were really able to uh, develop some of the local-led uh, solutions that could help um, scare and that could help uh, push away the elephants. And in the end, we actually had um, the ecosystem that has very less um, elephant uh, raiding incidences. And in that way, we see that uh, it's essential that um, refugees, youth, migrants are also uh, taken as integral part of whatever solutions and policies that we are devising, especially when it comes to integrated um, natural resources management. We also had um, some interactions in... Um, this is your last example. Sure, right? yes. So in another example, um, we had worked with the forest uh, management, and this is uh, in western parts of Kenya, where we are seeing uh, communities um, and also refugees can really be part of and practice uh, sound forest management practices. And this helped uh, quite a lot in ensuring that those forests and natural ecosystems that surround uh, refugees and also uh, the communities could actually um, keep their um, viability in terms of uh, producing and also supplying the vital ecosystem services that are required in those locations. And this includes um, such services as uh, water purification, but preservation and also conservation of water catchment areas, as well as other vital species that do uh, survive within the forests. As we understand that uh, whenever a refugee is being, uh, for example, when we are setting up new camps, there is quite a lot of uh, degradation that can potentially happen in those areas. Uh, in terms of wood that is required to, to, for cooking, uh, for energy, as well as uh, construction materials and also for daily subsistence. So what we see um, overall is that um, refugees, youth and other migrants are quite essential uh, when it comes to the nexus between especially agriculture, food systems, and conservation of the natural environment. Thank you. Wow. Did you guys get all that? That's really complex, right? The forest, the youth, the migrants, the biodiversity, yeah. the water requirements, and all how are challenging each other. And that's such a real reality. I don't think, um, we talked about Cameroon earlier, but uh, uh, Bernard, I'm sure, could give many examples in Cameroon as well as the one you gave in Kenya of how the forests are being threatened by the population needs for water, for, for firewood, for, you know, not to mention um, the lack of productivity of the land under cultivation, which is really the biggest challenge yeah. across the continent because people keep saying we're gonna expand land under cultivation rather than talking about better utilization of the resources that we have. But that's not easy, as you've described. I'm sure it's extremely challenging. Yeah. And I also want the numbers. Well, if you have another report, we're gonna create a database out of this, right? Because we wanna know more, how do we use this information? But 
Let's let's turn our mind. You mentioned Bangladesh, and wow, we have a Bangladeshi. Did you do that on purpose? I did. <laughs> he must have planned this. Uh, because um, I didn't even realize you were going to talk about Bangladesh, and we didn't even know we were talking about Asia. This is very exciting. So please, yeah. you know, we always <laughs> say that um, the, the Africa Food Systems Forum is not just African. There are some over 100 countries actually yeah. participating this week, mm -hmm. and uh, we constantly want to learn from best practices around the world uh, what, you know, who says progress should be linear? Who says we should reinvent things? So what are we missing? How can you really bring some of your ex experience? And um, you know, you're a youth champion, so we wanna know what it's really like because we all, uh, like young at heart is nice. I'm, you know, I'm trying, but really I'm not there yet and I'm trying to go back in time. So tell us what it's like to be a youth champion and what you've seen and what's your, um, your vision for, for how we can learn to do more uh, in, in this space, thanks. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Mehdi Hassan Tushar, and yes, I am from Bangladesh. And here, uh, I am an agriculturist, and here, first of all, I am an engine ambassador. And engine stands for Next Generation Agricultural Impact Network. It's a global organization which works for engaging the youth in agriculture by connecting the different continents at a one platform and to create a sustainable future for the agriculture. And the objectives of ENGINE is to create a global network to meet the need of next generation agricultural leaders, agriculturists, farmers, and the youth who are related to the agriculture and agri-entrepreneurships. And for that, ENGINE are providing a lot of skills and opening a lot of platform for the youth to work with and to empower themselves, like their uh, arranging impact and uh, gender training, exchange programs around the world, research and data sharing from what the youth can get the uh, information which is going on to the world and uh, provide a platform where you can share your experience. You can apply your ideas to the agricultural field to change the future of agriculture and uh, the most importantly mentorship. They are connecting the youth with some uh, global mentors who already have the experience of working in the floor of agriculture. They know everything and we can, the youth can get the experience from them and they can uh, create themselves like this uh, of their mentors. So uh, this is the uh, introduction of my, uh, an, uh, my organization that I work for, Engine. And I also work for another youth organization that is called YASH, that means International Association of Students in Agricultural and Related Science, which is branching through 50 plus countries and connecting one, more than 150, 150 agricultural university students at the same platform where uh, we can meet the different type of agricultural students around the world and we can know their uh, expertise and we can also learn a lot of things from them. And uh, the main uh, impact for this year is to creating a platform where the rural farmer can meet the young agriculturist and they can be benefited from them and the uh, youth agriculturist also can learn uh, the root level things from the rural farmers. And I work as a regional external relation coordinator in Yash Asia Pacific and a no food waste coordinator in the Yash world. And this, uh, these are some of my works for the youth organization. And you have asked for the role of youth. Yeah, for me, youth are the base of the world. And uh, the youth are the only one who can reach the minimum level to the maximum level of almost everything with the same energy and the same enthusiasm. So for me, youth are the best champion. And they can ensure the food security. They can ensure the nutritional security for their community, for their continent, for their reason. And they can become agri-entrepreneur. They can bring some changes, some innovation and technology to the field of agriculture to meet the future food demand in the, for the world. And uh, they can connect the world through a same platform with different kinds of agricultural organization and companies. So, uh, and uh, the main thing is the youth can take the challenge to uh, take one step ahead with a limited economical support. That is, that, is, uh, that is the main thing. So for me, youth is the best change maker in the food security field. Thank you. You got all that, right? Wow. Woo. 
I kind of now feel like we have to hear from everybody in the room. But um, you know, one of the things which we which we all think about is what um, what governments can do, right? And we're relying on the the voice of of the youth to better clarify and specify what governments can actually do. Because you say limited economic support, and I think that's really key. We talk about big programs which require a huge amount of funding, um, but sometimes it's really a small amount which is targeted in the right way, uh, which can go for better school feeding programs, right, which are more diversified, more nutritious food, or things we haven't even imagined yet. Um, what I would love to do is actually um, uh, suggest that we welcome Bernard and uh, Sam Lake back on the stage, and we just lost Ada, unfortunately, but I would like to open this up a bit and hear from the audience and be able to, to ask a couple questions, because they say nothing with us without us, nothing for us without us, right? And we have a great youth uh, audience, which we don't get too often. So if you don't mind, just join us up here. Uh, uh, Bernard, you can come back. And um, I, I was going to give my seat to Ada, but she's not even here. But let's just do a rapid fire questions uh, and, and hear from each of you, and then we can get some quick responses from the, the panel. So do we have a microphone for, who has some questions for, right, I knew it. You know, let's hear from you while the mic is coming. It's okay, we can hear you. With only, there you go, there you go. Yeah, maybe for the online. Oh, yeah. Uh, my name is Akira. I'm also part of Engine with Tushar, um, and I'm an ag agriculture engineer working with digital solutions for smallholder farmers. And about the refugee crisis, most of them they happen in, uh, in fragile areas, just like as Bernard uh, mentioned, and and fragile areas for the po po uh, political uh, environment, but mostly for the cl uh, climate shocks and. What for me, it's, uh, it's my key question. It's like, they are displaced, they are not in their uh, comfort zone. Um, uh, most of them, they have language barriers. So sometimes even for business, uh, I, I can see like, um, I'm Brazilian, I live in France, and it's really complicated sometimes even to, I already speak French um, fluently, but I still face some challenges. So is uh, agriculture a good way of uh, uh, having these uh, business opportunities that, uh, because of the language barriers, because it's the agricultural pr uh, product shocks, because most of those areas, they are desertic, or they have lack of uh, water resources, energy, and uh, what IFAD or other organizations have been doing to avoid this kind of uh, lacks. Thank you. Wonderful. Let's take a couple more questions. Now we've got the hands flying. And uh, if Ada shows back up, I'll give her my seat. And let's hear, now this is about digital and climate change for the previous question. Go ahead, please introduce yourself. Stand up. I, Apparently we have an online audience. I hope there's thousands of people around the world listening. I'm Nima from the World Food Program. Uh, my question is, this is specifically actually for Tanzania. When we're talking about employment for the refugees, uh, government feels like you know this kind of incentives will make the refugees not going back. So the government has been quite very strict in terms of providing this kind of incentive for um, refugees to be able to really fit themselves. So I'm just wondering what will be the role of development partners the international communities really when it comes to how do you support because if we, they can do a few uh, small businesses just within the area, if they can produce, it means even less burden to uh, donuts. So what could be the role of the international community for government that have been quite very strict? Thank you. Super question, I love it. Let's hear from you in the back here. Um, uh, the question about legality of work for refugees and then the food security angle, please. Hi, I'm Nana from IFAD, and uh, mine is more of a thought and a contribution. Um, Ada and I think Bernard were also speaking about employment and entrepreneurial opportunities for young people. 
And um, at IFAD also we have um, a youth integrated agri-hub program which really focuses on a mutually supportive function of, of an ecosystem that brings together private partners as well as, you know, building the confidence and the know-how and the technological, you know, know-how know of the young people. And in a recent dialogue that we've had with young people, we realized that a lot of young people are really just interested in having a job. And training alone, like we've all heard here, is not enough. You know, so how do we build this mutually inclusive ecosystem framework that young people can really thrive? Because from this hub initiative that we have within IFAD, it's currently in nine African countries. So the idea is really to train youth through an incubation hubs that we have across um, nine countries in Africa and really linking them to employment opportunities because most of them want a wage job like you and I. Not all of us want to be entrepreneurs. Not all of us want to be farmers. There are people that actually want a decent employment of a wage employment. So that's what the model is really focused on and really building that private sector partnership with you know, civil society organizations and with NGOs, etc., all to create that employment opportunity for job. And now there, are, there is the aspect of technology and also green jobs, but young people are very interested. We are innovative and we want opportunities that well, just a job like, you know, yourself and I. So that's the contribution that I wanted to also bring to the table. And it's not just about having that entrepreneurship spirit, but also focusing on the wage aspect and dimension, which this program is really focused on. Thank you. Wow, Bernard, you're going to have to, you know, leave your seat for Nana in a year or two. She's amazing. Okay, so let's hear from you back here. And you can introduce yourself quickly. You can stand up, speak clearly. And by the way, uh, this panel is going to have to answer all the questions with one rapid round on, but sometimes they say the questions are more important than the answers, so let's hear it. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Patrick, and I'm Patrick Martins from Uganda, and I lead Liberation Community Finance, a local microfinance uh, dealing with the agricultural value chain. Uh, the country I come from, Uganda, is hosts the largest community of refugees in the world and uh, the largest population of refugees in the world is seated in Uganda. And uh, one settlement called Bidi Bidi has the single largest concentration of refugees of approximately 250,000 people, or refugees. Now, we have had challenges on food because, uh, you know, when you have approximately 1.5 million people and up or slightly above in these rural communities who have also not been self-sufficient in terms of food, there's pressure on the community. There is uh, an emerging conflict between the communities and uh, the refugees. Of course, with uh, a lot of support from international agencies, the locals feel that the refugees are treated preferentially. So what I want to know the experience from the panel of how I've in what has been the experience in integrating refugees into the rural ecosystems in these rural hosting refugee hosting communities. Okay. And we how has it been able to also integrate them to contribute to the food value chains? so that they are able to serve themselves in the same communities with the hosting communities, and have they been able to be integrated in the financial sector inclusively? I hope that we have our note takers. And normally we have note takers in these sessions. I have no idea who's taking notes, but the questions are really, really interesting and robust. So I know you have the mic. Oh, let's hear from you, and then yourself, and yourself. Wow, you can answer 10 questions in one response, right? Okay, great. Yeah, okay, so I'm Abdul Kabir, and I'm a Next Gen Ag and Park Network Ambassador, just like uh, Mr. Tushar. i really impressed by the sh thoughts that were shared on the panel today. And um, particularly, I heard that um, it was really about how financing businesses alone was not enough, and it was important to create an enabling environment and policies for these businesses to thrive. So I'm interested in knowing exactly how in your own capacity, are you lobbying for these policies to be you know, um, created and included? Or what strategies do you currently have in place or would you propose to really get 
this policy is um, you know, structured to create the end of environment you described. Thank you. Well, I'm pretty, pretty sure that the closing remarks um, uh, are going to address that uh, question now. Uh, oh, right here, yeah. You're going to have to, you're going to have uh, run out of time. Good morning. Uh, my name's Courtney. I'm from New Zealand, and I'm also one of our engine ambassadors, and I'll keep my question really brief. Just want to acknowledge everyone, all the panelists and the moderator for their time this morning. My question is around data collection, especially in migrant and refugee workers, often people who are less accessible, they're in rural and more isolated communities. We had a few statistics this morning, and I just wanted to know how can we go about getting more accurate statistics? How can we make sure that all of these communities are better represented? And do we see any sort of deviation or error from the statistics that are available? Um, what do we think is a more accurate representation of the data that we've got out there at the moment? Thank you. I love that question. I always wonder, and uh, Ada talked about peeling back the numbers, and I think you can work with Ada on that as well. So let's hear your question. Uh, she's two mics, but one, two questions on the back side here. Great, and then one in the row behind her. Okay, thank okay. you. Hi, I'm also an engineer ambassador. I'm Josie and I'm from Australia. Um, I, I really agree that we've talked a lot about opportunity and entrepreneurship, as one of the other ladies said. Um, but for me, there's a level that I feel like we're not touching and whether or not it's a touchy topic in itself, and that is the exploitation of women, youth and refugees in agriculture and our global supply chain. Um, we have organisations committed to their CSR goals and mitigating modern slavery. And we talked about decent or stable work, so I wanted to know how are we empowering base level workers or refugees or youth or women in agriculture so they can consciously identify decent work? What does that look like here? Um, and how can we empower them to also leave um, in decent work? Um, and also train the entrepreneurs that are coming up so that they're not continuing to facilitate the cycle that may be accidental modern slavery again. Modern slavery. This is a, you know, um, I, I went with my mother and my daughter. Have you seen this film that just came out? Uh, what's it called? About um, child, child trafficking. It's really phenomenal. Because, sorry? The Voice of Freedom. The Voice of Freedom, something like that, yeah. Because I, I, I really agree with you. It's a subject we don't want to talk about. It's in front of people. People know about it. Anyway, look it up. It's, it's really profound. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you very much. And compliments, amazing session. <laughs> um, Sonne Bex, also involved in Engine, but uh, a lot of heads, I for nature, but I have the privilege to work as an officer in the Dutch uh, Army. Uh, and within the European and NATO context, we are working on getting um, deployed camps more sustainable, uh, trying to create, especially from the Dutch perspective uh, and European, uh, to create a legacy where you put in deployed camps. There's maybe an easy answer, but also a difficult one. But is there a possibility that if we take out the silo uh, sheds to see uh, how we can combine uh, making food security kind of elements, energy, etc., in a deployed camp, leaving a legacy whilst working with the local stakeholders uh, from maybe it's difficult, UN, NATO, and, and these kind of fora, but I think there's a lot of potential there if we pull out uh, the, the walls between them. Yeah, let's break those silos down. Uh, uh, okay, your, yours is the last question, my dear. So jump up, grab the mic, right around the pillar. You have this lovely lady running towards you from the back end. Okay, great. Next time I do a room like this, we're doing name badges. Okay, thank you. Good morning. My name is Peg Mlewa. Uh, I'm from Zambia. I'm with the Ministry of Agriculture. I just wanted to contribute a bit to the question that was raised by um, the participant from Uganda uh, in terms of the situation of um, migrant worker, migrants. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Immigrants, yeah. I'll give an example of Zambia. We've had that because Zambia is surrounded by eight countries and most of them have gone through a period of uh, uh, destabilization, in the Congo, uh, Angola, just to mention a few. And uh, I think the starting point to address the issue that you have talked about, the conflicts between the locals and the ones that come in, starts from the policy perspective. I think if you make the policies 
that are very consultative, includes the local authorities, the chiefs, the chiefdoms where those um, mi migrants are housed. I think it helps to kind of diffuse the conflict. I think that's what we have done as a government. We have consult we've been very consultative in our process of integrating migrants uh, to the point that even in the localities where they stay, for example in Mahera, you find that those are very productive. They've been given their own portions of land which they exploit for agriculture purposes and they contribute a lot in terms of food security. They're able to produce a lot that is even uh, able to, uh, I think, um, service even beyond uh, the, the areas where they stay. And even among us themselves, they come with skills that help to actually lift in terms of productivity and production within the areas that they stay. So we've seen a positive impact from integrating those um, migrants uh, from other countries which are conflict ridden. Solutions, amazing. And I've been to Zambia and I've been to Uganda and I suggest we do more South-South cooperation. Wonderful, okay, I hope you're all going on a visit journey to see each other. So let's come back to this uh, very esteemed panel uh, with extremely diverse experiences and just hear from you, Stan Lake, starting on your end, we'll go all the way down. Some of your thoughts, contributions, uh, and um, proposals based on uh, what I think was the very, very interesting series of questions. Good, well, thank you, and thank you also to the audience for raising these various points. Uh, I just want to deal with the ones on uh, the refugees uh, and then give two quick examples of some of the things that we've done that also respond to some of the issues that have been raised. Uh, I used to be some years ago, I was the WFP country representative in Uganda. Uh, I managed the, the refugee uh, support operations that we, we did there. Uganda has a very uh, open approach. Uh, in part, that's because many of the leaders in Uganda were refugees themselves. So they've taken an approach that's very welcoming. Uh, Colombia is also like that. Uh, there are countries in the world that allow refugees, that integrate them into their systems, that allow them to work, to produce, to uh, do the things that citizens can do. And as UN agencies, of course, we encourage this. We also, more than a decade ago, we stopped targeting refugees and, uh, specifically, and we all, always include the host communities. In many situations, the host communities are in, in sometimes even worse situation than refugees. And it really, it isn't helpful to anybody to single out people because of their status. You need to support people because of the needs that they have, whether they're refugees or they're local people. And that's the way we approach it. I think that that is the best uh, approach. Certainly the UN system has moved in that, uh, in that direction. Two quick examples of things that I really like that we are doing. In El Salvador, we are supporting uh, a, a lot of young people to become chefs. Actually, we're working with the Ministry of Tourism there, funded by the Inter-American Development Bank and the government, to support people to become, uh, young people, to get training as chefs and to then work in local restaurants. The Ministry of Tourism likes this because it increases the the appeal of El Salvador restaurants and the community is they're trying to build tourism. Also, it keeps people away from the gangs, which is the big uh, issue in El Salvador. My favorite activity that we do actually occurs in Upper Egypt. This is where we used to distribute, which is the poorest part of Egypt. We distributed food in some of the the very rural areas, but then we, t we did an experiment. We also distributed tablets. We gave people, in addition to the food, we would distribute in all of the schools uh, tablets, uh, not iPads, but you know, tablets that people could play on. Actually, what we saw was that the kids came early to school to play with the tablets, you know, to use them just like my kids do, they can spend the whole day on tablets, but the, the kids, it wasn't the food that was attracting them, it was the tablets. In Egypt, uh, there's connectivity to a national database, so once you're online, you have access to everything. And kids started to develop the technical skills 
that actually you need to survive in the 21st century. But not only that, we, we saw that after school, the teachers were using the tablets to improve their teaching skills so, in fact, they could move on to better environments. Uh, I, I, for me, education, digital skills, this is the future. This is what we have to link and integrate in our programs. Thank you. He's such an optimist. Isn't that impressive after all these years? Okay, so um, I'm going to come back to you, and, and I would love to, to have your input, uh, suggestions, ideas, more questions, but I'm going to cut you off if you talk too long. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you for the nice questions that you have asked. So first of all, I want to answer some of the questions of them. First of all, uh, Akira from here, he asked that about the language barrier and political problem and climate shortage of the refugees. Okay, uh, yes, this is one of the biggest problem in the refugee camp is the language barrier. Uh, if I talk about my country, there are uh, a lot of refugees, uh, near about 10 lakhs. So the main problem is they use a language that is called Rakhine language, Rohingya. So there is no written form of this language. So it's only the verbal communication they do. So if you want to learn this, you have no way to uh, write it or no way to learn from this. So you basically you need a translator to understand them. So it's really a big problem to translate their language. And it's, uh, it's possible when you are working with some NGOs or uh, government, you went to them and uh, talked with the translator. But e in general, you are communicating with them is uh, difficult. So this is the main problem. Another thing is political problem, yes. Uh, the political problem is here, that's why they are the refugees. They are uh, 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 forcibly displaced from their country. So the political problem should be minimized. Uh, the uh, international organizations and international body, they should uh, take over the situation, take over to the country they, they are uh, fleet from so, uh, to minimize the political problem. And the climate shortage, yeah, uh, when uh, you, we are talking about some developing country, so there are some uh, climate or natural resources shortage. So for that, the uh, um, problem between the host and the refugees are increasing because uh, they all are uh, diversing for the same resources or same, uh, um, what should I say, same uh, land. So this is the problem. So if we want to overcome this problem, we need to focus on these things. Another question was there from that is the role of, it. there is a lot of things that uh, international bodies can do for the refugees, like they can reduce the violence between the host uh, community and the refugees, and uh, they can take some steps to uh, return back to them to their own country, and uh, they can uh, support sustainable uh, supporting for the sustainable development, and they can also uh, uh, incre they can also uphold some laws, international laws, which can be followed with the host country and the refugees, so that they can uh, live together. And uh, another uh, question was there about uh, uh, policy making and strategies from uh, Abdul. So uh, for me. Uh, to answer this question, I have three points. One is uh, repatriation, local integration, and resettlement. So, if we want to, uh, uh, if we want to hold the dignity of the refugees, so we need to work together with the host community and the refugees. And the local integration of the refugees allows to um, uh, to live there uh, to live uh, uh, with their dignity and something. And resettlement is also needed for the. Uh, Mm, uh, for maintaining a good community. And uh, another uh, question was from Josie is that how uh, you can empower the refugees. So for that, uh, I can say that uh, we need to provide them the basic education and the, um, and the uh, information about the recent condition where they are living. So that's, uh, that's how uh, we can uh, empower them to work together. So that's all from mine. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madi Hassan. This is a revolving panel, you notice? We're an open forum, an open platform, and we're so pleased that uh, Mr. Kitare could join us. Um, so we'll let you settle in and listen to some of this discussion, and then you can make your remarks towards the end. 
Um, and uh, if you feel like you should be on stage with the panelists, you're welcome. You know, we don't want to exclude anybody either. Um, but we will wrap up on time because many of you have a, another session at 11:10 on the spot. So, um, but just so you know, Mr. K Had, is it Kaita of Kodiga Cooperative, uh, and uh, I'm sure he'll share his story with us. But just to wrap up on the questions, and then IUCN has such a unique perspective in this conversation because of the challenges between people, displaced people, and as you mentioned, um, the, the, the biodiversity challenges, which many people really struggle because if you say, you know, a human can't eat, then of course we're gonna challenge biodiversity. Uh, and you've heard some of the interesting questions about uh, from Madame from the Ministry of Agriculture of Zambia uh, the policy level, which you referenced as well, and then the forestry. And I used to work a little bit on fisheries. You know, um, the, 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 the decay within the oceans as well is something that is invisible, but we see the forest depletion. So anyway, I'm adding questions to your many um, comments, just so you can, you can uh, comment on some of the questions, and then Bernard, you can wrap us up, and we'll come back to the, the new panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, so my only addition would be also the fact that um, we can also view, uh, for example, migration and especially um, internal mi migration as an opportunity. Because sometimes it could be uh, people are moving from one place to another uh, just because of uh, climate related uh, risks or, for example, land degradation and so on. So by moving, that could be one of the ways uh, that they are trying to adapt uh, to climate change. So migration can be viewed um, in, in dual face, uh, people trying to adapt. But again, um, for example, if we talk of um, integration into, into the value chains, there, there are quite a lot of uh, good developments in terms of policies and as well as uh, global conventions there are quite a number of uh, new developments that would allow for uh, integration into the local food systems. But I think um, the issue or the opportunity now is how do we localize uh, those policies? How do we localize uh, action points that arise out of these uh, conventions? We have some of the uh, burning issues when it comes to, for example, uh, land tenure issues. Um, access to finance, uh, access to risk management uh, products, all these are quite essential if we are to really um, integrate uh, migrants or refugees into the local food systems. So that, that would be my, my quick reflections on that, yeah. Can somebody write down his exact words? We want to take global conventions and agreements and localize them and to make them meaningful in the agri-food systems. That is the tweet of the whole session. I hope you got it, huh? You're all, because really, um, you, you're so right. We're, we're, we heard from Madam uh, Minister um, Mariam Almahari that we're moving to the COP28, and she's working really, really hard to integrate this food and agri-systems into the COP28, which is hopefully gonna advance the global conventions, yeah. and yet we're struggling, as you've all described, to localize them. And, yeah. and that's really the world we're living in. We have to be at both ends of the spectrum. So Bernard, uh, your, your neighbor just talked about risk management and, um, uh, and access to finance. Uh, the microphone, he wants the handheld mic on your right-hand side. Yeah, that one, exactly, smart guy. Okay, Bernard, give us some new insights. How can we manage the risks? I mean, quickly, from my end, I think there was a point on uh, fragility. That the driver of fragility is not just conflict crisis. You know, it goes beyond this. Extreme poverty can lead people to move. You see, uh, the weak governance, you know, institutional issues, the competition over natural resources, you know, all those things adding to conflict can bring people to move. So that's one point. And language barrier, actually, usually, uh, when you are in situation, because you have to, you do your analysis, you know your bottlenecks and so on. So if this is really a constraining factor, you will include as activity in your project some sort of, you know, uh, language or literacy program, you know, to address this. And uh, I would say, basically, it's not also just about production.
because you are thinking about you know creating so helping people to create micro enterprises in the rural areas in Niger, for example, where one of our projects was targeting 20,000 people, we managed to address, you know, to support 2,000 internally displaced people and migrants, helping them to create businesses, for example, bakeries. They were purchasing the, pro the, the product, you know, they were sourcing from the farmers, okay, the bakeries, and the others were doing handicraft, things like this. So you see, there are other opportunities beyond just the farming. So this is what I would like to add to this. And even when we are talking about value chain, for example, the youth, the Cameroon case I was talking about, it goes beyond production. Some of the youth are, you know, selling inputs. Other, you know, are service providers, you know, going around. When the season is starting, they go around, they sell their services to establish, to prepare the farm. They see, they plant the seeds. And then they will come back during harvest. They are using multifunctional, you know, tractors, you know, where they can change the equipment and provide a different type of services, you know. Others were in restaurants, for example, sourcing from other youth, you know, to cook for uh, uh, people. So a, a, a very large, you know, a, a area of, um, of services within the value chain. Regarding the refugees, I think somebody from Uganda was mentioning that Uganda is having the highest number of refugees in the world. Actually, I relocated in West Africa two weeks ago. I was before that in Istanbul, covering Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Uganda is having 1.5 million refugees, but Turkey is having 4 million refugees, Syrian refugees. So Turkish is the, Turkey is the biggest country. It's not a competition you want to win, okay. believe me. <laughs> no. Uh, now, you are right. You are right because sometimes we tend to focus on the refugees, and this creates situation problems, you know, in the community. We need to adopt a holistic approach, keeping in mind that we want to address local or promote local economic development. So what we do in IFAD, though we target, you know, the migrant, though we target the internally displaced people, we do not lose the point that, you know, it's about local economic development. So usually what we do, we try to revise the project implementation manual to also target those ones. So this is a way to go about it. In Turkey, it was easy because basically there was a shortage of labor in the agricultural sector. So it was very quick, you know, to actually mobilize those ones, you know, for them to support the sector. But in Africa, what we do is to revise those project implementation manual and also target the refugees, also target um, the, uh, the IDPs so that they will also benefit from the opportunities you know, at the same level as the host uh, population. In the spirit of inclusivity and appreciation for the diversity of this room, I would like you to thank all of those who have spoken, all those who have asked questions. Wow. Again, this is a knowledge base that's not to be missed. And now we want to hear from the voice of those who've lived it. So I can ask all the panelists except Kitare to return to the audience. Um, and we'll ask Kitare and Shema and an additional panelist who has joined us, Alice, to come sit on this stage here. And we have an interpreter because I'm not sure we're all going to understand Alice's language. So we're very, very um, fortunate to have the voice of two who have come out of the refugee system and really experienced what we're talking about firsthand. And we hope that you'll share your stories with us and some of your insights. Now they came late, so they won't have heard all of our wonderful debates and discussions, but I'm sure they know them by heart. Um, and for each of you, I'm gonna come sit with you here. I think this is the one that works. Thank you for joining us. I hope you get to come and visit lots of conventions around the world, but we're really pleased that you're both here. My name is Vanessa. We didn't get a chance to meet ahead of time. And this audience is your, your best friends. The, the people that have been here really wanting to know and experience how can they help. Both of you are, are youth. You've lived through so many challenges personally and with those around you. 
And we would really like to learn from your experience, your suggestions, your ideas, your, and your recommendations. Now we're towards the end of our session, so we only have 10 minutes. So you can share as much as you can, and each of you gets a couple of minutes to, to give us your insights and your views, um, and, and really what your suggestions are. If we come away from here doing one or two things concretely, what are those one or two things that everyone here can contribute to that will make a difference? So let's start with you, Kit, Kit, Kitare, Shema. Please tell us in your view. You've heard the discussion. Let's kick it off. Thank you. Uh, greetings to you all. My name is Kaitareshem. I am a Congolese refugee. Uh, I am a married man. I have a wife and five children. I am a farmer. A Kodiga. This cooperative started in 2022. Uh, since then, I have cultivated three content. In this three, I got the, pro the product twice and once. I lost it, but I, I just didn't give up because the UNSCR staff came close to me many times. That is why I appreciate UNSCR. Now I am out of isolation because I have a place to work. I gained a lot of knowledge from our fellow citizens who stayed with us. I learned a lot of from them. The sponsor have trained us on many things so far I have knowledge following proper planting, soil preparation, proper use of additional product, follow the plant well until they come, don't plant in the crash, plant one plant as a way to increase the harvest, five, the best method of harvesting and processing the market well. Six, how we should take care of plant due to weather condition to sun or to rain. Do I do now? Uh, I, now I have a different knowledge. I am happy and I have the effort to continue harvesting the agriculture processing pro profession that, that aim to improve as well uh, as we have started. Now we take 50% of the production home and sell 70% of the production. I plan, uh, I plan to develop myself, develop my family, develop the area I live in, develop the country and the world. In a few words, thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, we're happy that you've learned and uh, have this agricultural experience. Alice, share your experience with us as well. And Anthony, we can just turn off your mic. Yeah. Can I, uh, she doesn't speak English, so I wanted to translate for her. Please, you're welcome. Okay. Um, yeah. Just for a few background about them, I, I said my name is Kiza and um, I'll not go into my other inter, uh, titles, but my relationship with them is because I, I, I worked with them in refugee camps in Rwanda, near the border of Congo. So the fact that we're here, I thought I should also come and, and uh, support them somehow. So this one can speak some English, but not as good. So I know you may be quick to judge, but those are some of the challenges they face while, you know, where they come from, they speak French generally and Swahili but they still have to deliver here, so you may have to bear with them. For Alice, she doesn't speak any English, so I will try to interpret to her in Kinyarwanda, then she can tell the story, then I will also interpret it in English. Alice, Alice, so we take Matubira Mucinerguana, you
Yo mu Rwanda twariko twahunze duturutse muri Congo ahitwa Inyamitabo I'm a refugee from Rwanda I'm a refugee now coming from Rwanda but uh, I originally come from uh, Congo in a place called Inyamitabo Duhunga byari ibintu bikaze cyane binadutunguye kuko twabonaga iwacu ari heza cyane nta nikintu kibasha kudukurayo kuko twara abatunzi tworoye inka tunwa mata tukanahinga ibyo kuriya byaho ubona nta kibazo tubifiteho ari inshuti abaturanyi tuguwe neza cyane ubwo twara komeje ibintu byakunda ko tuhaba turahunga tunyuri kirori rwe ikabati tugeze ikabati bakaje badutangira ngo ni dutahi wacu mu Rwanda ibyo dufite tukigura bakemera tugatambuka ubwo nibwo twakomeje tugeze mwibambiro banga ko tuhava turahatinda cyane bamwe turanatata na barabura kugeza na nubu nti baraboneka right, as uh, you know when she used to live with her family in DRC Congo before the conflict, yes, there were other conflicts, but not in their own village. But at some point, the conflicts also approached their village, so they had to run away. In so doing, she, you know, collected the few they could have with their family and, and, and her kids, uh, rather her family relatives, because she wasn't married by then. Then they ran up to the border of Congo. Of course, on the way, they, they met the rebels and they took all the things they had carried, all the money. They only were left with uh, clothes they had on until they were received at the border of Congo ngo twinjiye tunyuze kuri grande barriere abanyarwanda baratwakira batubaza makuru yibanze batujyana muri transit ya nkamira tumara mwameza atandatu tumaze mwameza atandatu batujyana inyabiheke na nubu niho turi niho nubakiye ubwo twarahabaye hashize imyaka 5 narashatse nahageze mfite 23 they were received at the border of Congo by the government of Rwanda, then handed over to, uh, processed by UNHS Allah. UNHS Allah took them to a place called Nyabiheche. Is a, uh, before they were in a resettlement processing center, but later they were taken to a refugee camp where they live now. From there she married, uh, she found, uh, she met her husband, and she was by then 23. She met her husband, and now uh, they have three kids, two boys and one girl. And there, uh, she continues to live with her story. Good. <laughs> tutangira kujya tujya guhinga tugahingira amafaranga kugira ngo turebe ko turi bujye tubona ibyo kurya no kwambara from there she uh, they had an issue with food as refugees you can understand probably you may not understand it because probably you've never been refugees but she said that she had issues uh, with food uh, with her family they used to try to go to the local community to beg for food yes they were given some little food from NHS but that wasn't enough so what they would do, they would go to look for casual, to work as casual laborers for the local community. They would work, dig, and be paid food in return. Haza kuza hasere iradufasha cyane iduha mahirwe twishimiye cyane idukodeshereza ubutaka tukayatubuhinga bungana na reshano later on she was uh, they were able to start working for money and you, from that money now they were even able to uh, to buy for themselves some food but later UNHS came up with a program uh, which was to rent a, uh, acres of land which they could give them parcels for them to start cultivating. And from there, she was, uh, she, for her current year, she's cultivating two pieces of land, where she has, uh, last year she was able to harvest 300 kilograms of grain. Baduhimbuto, bakaduhifumbire, tugahinga, bakaduha 
n’imiti yo kubitera ubwo tukaba dusaruramo nk’ibiro bingana na magana atatu mirongo itanu mirongo magana abiri mirongo irindwi tukayijyana mu rugo magana abiri mirongo irindwi tukabijyana ku isoko mirongo inane tukabijyana mu rugo bikadufasha mu byokurya the country, uh, the harvest would increase based on the fertilizers. UNHCR Sala would uh, organize trainings, but also uh, offer, you know, fertilizers for them to be able to increase on the productivity. And uh, the later year, she was able to harvest 300 kilograms, and some of it would be she would keep it for home consumption. But the le most of it, which is 70 percent, would go she would sell on the market. So the cocoa fifty minute period to be sure. Of God. Ayo mafaranga adufasha gukemura ibibazo byo mu rugo no kwiteza imbere nkabangira ngo amahirwe yatugezeho ari ibishoboka bakabo yageza no kubandi bose bimpunzi nkatwe habasoza ngira nti ndashimira hasere na leta y'u Rwanda yaduhaye ubuhungira ah she uh, le, as she wraps up her, her talk then she said that as refugees they would definitely appreciate that kind of opportunity and arrangement where they are also included in, in, in the community development, but also in inclusion in terms of agriculture. She was able to have an opportunity to ha have access to land and also involved in production. And she's happy with that. She can no longer go back to street on begging, but rather she also contributes food on the market. And she thinks that it would be really a great idea if all other refugees e everywhere, they would have such kind of arrangement where they can be part of the solution rather than be seen as a burden. Thank you so much for her. Wow, thank you. Wow. Thank you. Murakozi Chane. Murakozi Chane. Merci beaucoup. That's okay. You wanted to add something, Anthony? Some she wants to speak something later in in Kinyarwanda, something small or other then so that he can he can finish it. Eh Murakoze ndongera gushimira mu byukuri abateguye iki gikorwa cyo kugaragaza amaranga mutima yacu natwe bakatwibuka nk'impunzi eh tukagira mu ruhare nagiraga ngo mvuge mu ncamake ko iyo cooperative tubamo yadufashije nkuko mugenzi wanje abivuze eh turashimira HCR kimwe nabandi batera nkunga bita ku mpunzi by'umwe hariko eh tunashimira ni ni leta ya hano yatwakiriye ikatwemerera ko natwe tugira uruhare muri iki kiganiro e iyo cooperative igizwe n'abanyarwanda n'impunzi byadukuye mu bwigunge kamvuge gake ugiye gusoza ko ni minota yarangiye he says that uh, he really thank you the organizers of his, this event that not often not every day you get to see refugees who are from from the uh, camps to come and participate on these high profile events but with the support of your organizing committee and also the government of Rwanda, they have been facilitated to also come and share their views from their own experiences and their own stories. Mu byukuri tukaba tubifuriza mugisha kandi mu byukuri nk'impunzi natwe tutangiye kwigirira ikizere ko natwe turi abantu kimwe nabandi tukaba mu byukuri tubashimiye kuko nkuko twabivuze leta y'u Rwanda yaduhuje n'abanyarwanda iduhuza mu bikorwa bijyanirenye no kwiteza imbere mu buhinzi eh rero mu byukuri turabashimira kandi turashimira ni leta yatwakiriye eh ahi gikorwa kiri kubera tubifuriza umugisha mu nakoze he wraps up by saying that uh, uh, the government of Rwanda will come them from you know Congo as you may, con may know Congo has been you know involved in conflicts for decades and decades but uh, for him being a refugee uh, that did not mean that he could not be part of the local, you know, integrated. In, he, they were integrated within the local community, and they coexist, you know, peacefully. And they also engage with each other in agriculture. And we saw they produce. They even have an association called an cooperative where they all gather ideas and get engage in the training. Then they also contribute on the, on, on the local market with the produce they have. And so they thank you for really an opportunity to recognize them and be able to listen to them. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Murakozi Chane. Next year we'll be in Kigali, and we hope to see you again and learn how your Ariko are doing and all the food you're growing. Thank you so much, Murakozi. I hope you're all going to join us next year in Kigali. We just learned this morning that that's the plan. Uh, and, you know, um, 
It's true that uh, many countries are suffering from continuous change, continuous organization, restructuring, and this productivity discussion about going from working as casual labor, and you were asking the question, to being your own, in control of your own food security is really fundamental livelihoods. We talk about food sovereignty. So Zlatan Mislik, Milislik, I don't know if I can pronounce it. It's, you're going to fix it, the pronunciation for me. Is resident coordinator for the United Nations here in Tanzania. Clearly has so much experience and, and has heard these discussions patiently waiting. We really want to learn from your own experience. You can answer any of the questions. You can throw out your speech. You can read it as is um, and challenge us as we look forward. Uh, we appreciate uh, any uh, insights because everybody here, I think, is action-oriented. Thank you so much. Distinguished panelists, young people, and as including those who are young at heart. Thank you. <laughs> food system stakeholders, agro officials, my UN colleagues, our friends, refugees, and friends of refugees, invited guests. Good morning, bonjour, abariza subui, salam alaikum. My name is Zlatan Milisic and I'm the UN resident coordinator here in Tanzania. And I work with a team of 24 agencies, organizations of the UN system in implementing our United Nations Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, where we also have the World Bank uh, and other international financial organizations being signatory and being part of our joint work. The important thing I want to say about our work in Tanzania, which is very relevant to this context, is that within our cooperation framework, we include and encompass the refugee operations in the Northwest together with all the other program activities in Tanzania for people of Tanzania. So we're trying to see this holistically and try to complement and actually do things for the benefit of the broader communities, not to select, we can choose. Uh, I'm really, I'm going to try to make this interesting for you. But I think we all here in the room, and of course our panelists have given us some excellent insights, but I think we all here in the room should remember these last two testimonies as the main things we've heard today. And I was so happy really to hear our friends speaking earlier. I'm really okay. delighted to have joined this enlightening session which highlights the crucial role that young refugees, migrants, and displaced people can play in our food systems, especially in fragile context. At the end of 2022, a staggering 104 million people were forcibly displaced worldwide due to persecution, conflict, violence, and human rights violations. This included 35 million refugees and 63 million internally displaced people. Additionally, that same year, we have witnessed 280 million international migrants. Together, this ends up to 400 million people, girls, boys, men, and women, each with their stories, with their dreams, and also with their potential. Many of these, uh, many of these individuals, driven by hope and resilience, have found their place in our food systems, from sowing the seeds to serving or cooking meals. Yet, in their journey, they grapple with immense challenges including poverty, malnutrition, and sometimes deprivation of fundamental rights. The Sustainable Development Goals, at, that, at their very core, emphasize the principle of leaving no one behind. As the United Nations, we hold this commitment at the highest regard. Refugees, displaced people, migrants stand among those most marginalized in our society. Their plight underscores our collective responsibility, and our approach should not just be aid, but also empowerment. It is imperative that we change this prevailing narrative surrounding these populations. 
They are not mere statistics or faceless masses. They are individuals just like each one of us. The circumstances that they have faced may be dire, but their potential remains vast. The young among them especially, with their adaptability, innovation, and enthusiasm can help bring transformative changes to our food systems. Today's panelist discussions and the uh, testimonies we just heard have brought forward compelling narratives of how, when given opportunity, young refugees, migrants, displaced people have not just contrib contributed to, but also enhanced our food systems. This is also testament to the boundless potential that largely remains untapped. In recent years, our region, including Tanzania, has been facing major challenges due to various factors, including COVID-19, uh, climate crisis, the effects of the war in Ukraine. They all impacted on our food systems. Displacement increased by 5 million refugees, 9 million internally displaced. COVID disrupted mobility, affecting livelihoods tied to food systems. Economic losses, lockdowns, inflation, and supply chain issues worsened food insecurity, and again, particularly for vulnerable groups. Addressing these challenges remains humanitarian action, but also a development approach. And we must recognize the critical rule, role of food systems. It's important that people can get the help that they need during crisis. To address food security within countries and within regions, we need to recognize also the role of remittances, the importance of adapting migration rules for essential workers in food production and supply chain, promoting gender and youth sensitive responses and improving data collection and coordination amongst various stakeholders. UN agencies in Tanzania and across the region have been working together with many partners and stakeholders to help create resilient, sustainable, and climate smart agro-food systems with durable solutions for refugees and displaced people, focusing on gender inclusivity and equality. Young refugees and migrants can play a transformative role in food systems and rural development if they are adequately supported to increase their knowledge, skills, and overall capacity, and if given the opportunity. In Rwanda, we've just heard, we have inspiring examples of joint programs supported by UNHCR, WFP, FAO, the government of Rwanda, private sector partners, and agricultural project has successfully brought together refugees and members of host community. This initiative aims to create a strong evidence base on how to enhance self-reliance focusing on livelihoods and economic inclusion within a comprehensive whole of community approach. In Uganda, FAO, and in collaboration with UNHCR and government of Uganda and private sector, has been working to promote self-reliance of refugees and host communities. These involve building the capacities of refugees and host community members to engage in market-oriented sustainable production and agribusiness to develop profitable and sustainable value chains and to provide scalable energy solutions for cooking and to support agricultural livelihoods and to diversify their income. Closer to, tom to home here in Tanzania, an area-based United Nations joint program which involves 17 UN organizations is supporting the building of climate resilience agri-food systems in the Kigoma region, and it, which hosts 250,000 refugees. Refugees are supported to establish kitchen gardens and grow nutritious food to complement food rations in the camps. And they also acquire skills that can often help them rebuild their lives when they come back home to their countries of origin. Esteemed colleagues, friends, partners present today. Your roles are pivotal. 
your advocacy, your efforts, and your commitment can shape a future where these young women and men are not just seen as beneficiaries, but as contributors. The inclusion of young people in agri-food business and systems is not merely an act of support. It is a strategic initiative that amplifies our journey towards sustainability. Our collective aspirations embodied in Sustainable Development Goals and the African Union Agenda 2063 call for us to recognize that sustainable food systems are integral to achieving broader development goals. Harnessing the potential of our youth, including those displaced, migrating, or seeking refuge, should be the cornerstone of this vision. Together, let us chart a path where everyone is a stakeholder in sustainable, inclusive, and prosperous food systems for Africa. Thank you very much. Is this, thank you so much, all of you. Um, why don't we have a photo shoot? Because you're all amazing. Just jump on the stage. We'll do a quick picture with everyone who's been with us. I Come on, let's go. And uh, we're going to wrap up because we want to see all of you in Kigali next year. Come on, come on, come on, all of you. Even the Dutch army. <laughs> everyone, everyone in the whole room. This is a, takes a community. Everybody, come on, come on. Yes, you didn't have to be a speaker. This is a community. It's a community of practice. Yes? And we have a photographer here. This is really, like, who, who sits for two and a half hours straight, waiting patiently for their turn, joins the platform at the last? Come on, come on. Even a couple suits. We talked about financing. We talked about land. We talked about beans. We talked about buying locally. We talked about Bangladesh. We talked about Brazil. We talked about France. We talked about Rwanda. Squeeze this way. We can't see you behind the pillar over there. Come on, squeeze in. You can sit in front. Some of you are young enough. You can sit in front. You can, if you want to get in front. Okay. Yes, you can. You can. There's plenty of that makes it much more interesting. Great. Formidable. Can you Rwanda? Well, how many languages do we have on this stage, huh? Okay, photographer, you ready? Okay, we're going to say beans because we're talking about food systems. Ready? One, two, three. Beans. C'est bon? Who's doing the selfie? Let's go. Aha. Uh -huh. Our cooperative coordinator. Squeeze in for the selfie. Both sides. Ready? Cheese. cheese. No, no, no. Not cheese. Beans. Oh, you go forward. You can get us all. <laughs> no, no, no. We want all at once. He needs practice on the selfie screen, huh? Aha. There you go. Morakozi chane. Morakozi chane. Asante sana. Okay, fantastic, thank you. There's the main hall uh, plenary wrap-up session, and if you haven't visited all the booths, I hope you get out to the exhibits. Thank you so much.